secondary agriculture and its products, process integration and intensification, process development, characterization, and scale up. Uh, Professor Anama has did her uh, BSc and MSc microbiology, uh, BSc microbiology and MSc life science at the University of Mumbai. Followed up, she did a PhD diploma in bioinformatics. After she qualified for the CSA JRA fellowship and the ICMR JRA enzyme, she entered the ICT Mumbai for PhD in applied chemistry, and she is working there since then. Uh, Professor Anama has co-authored and co-authored more than 77 research publications in various national and international journals. Uh, Professor Anama was a part of a team led by Professor Arvind Lalli that conceptualized and implemented India's first ever 2G ethanol plant. It was inaugurated in the town of Kashipur in Uttarakhand in uh, April 2006 and is capable of processing 10 tons of agricultural waste in a single day. Uh, with this short introduction, I welcome Professor Anama. Uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, sir, for a very kind introduction. And uh, good morning, students. Uh, my job is a pretty simple job here today, in comparison to the different uh, classical lectures that we give on topic. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch upon certain areas of uh, media design and why this is very important. And I'll also try and touch upon the innovations that are coming up in the area. Innovations like implementation of uh, artificial intelligence or modeling of media design so that you get better outputs. And so the overall gist of the whole uh, session would be to give you a flair of how uh, crucial it is to design medium and how all the work that we do is totally dependent on our capabilities of media design. So what to you, please feel free to stop me in between if there are some questions or uh, queries. Yes. So is my screen visible to all? Yes, Professor. Just trying. So I have modified the screen a little, uh, modified the topic a little bit to touch upon the selection, growth, and production medium, all the three of which are basically fine-tuned to meet their objectives for any microbiological activity. But before I start, I should tell you why we are here. We are here because we want to use different kinds of microorganisms for a whole lot of applications that we think they may be essential to. So in currently when we are moving slowly into a bioeconomy and that too of a bioeconomy of a circular nature where we want everything that we produce, the raw materials, the end products, the side streams, the waste streams, all of them should be utilized for the benefit of benefit of uh, humankind. So in these aspects, if you look at the entire network or the net, entire cycles that we have, so be it the carbon cycle, be it the sulfur cycle, nitrogen cycle, in all these cycles, we see that there is a very distinct role of microorganisms. And nature over the years or environment over the years has maintained these cycles and pushed up its tools or its microorganisms in this entire cycle nature so that it can utilize the resources and change it back from one form to the other so that different plants and animals can use it. So that this is exactly what we are trying to do under the industrial biotechnology platform, but in an aggravated manner and also in a manner where your scales are huge. Okay. Now the scales that we are talking about here are scales to the order of a few hundred tons. So if you're looking at 
actual perspective, we are looking at a few hundred liters per day production that we are looking at. Small molecules like penicillin or um, any antibiotic that we are looking at, these would come in some kgs per day. So you have the entire scale of operations that we need. And we need to understand microorganisms to understand how to grow them so that we are able to be, enable this entire free. So white biotechnology, also known as industrial biotechnology, is a field which uses microorganisms and their enzymes to produce goods for the industry, such as chemicals, plastics, pharmaceuticals, food, and energy carriers. Now, this, this branch of biotechnology uses living cells from molds, from bacteria, plants, and yeasts to synthesize easily degradable products. It may need less energy and produce fewer byproducts, but the overall concept is that we use microorganisms or living cells, all sorts of living cells for metabolite production, for waste treatment, for biocontrol agents, biofuels, energy, etc. whichever application you can do. Now, let me start by telling you some of the companies around the world which are leveraging this power of microorganisms. Common names that you would know of as DuPonts, the DSMs, the BASFs, the ADMs, all these are industries which use microorganisms and then they benefit by this. They are able to produce small molecules, they are able to produce pharmaceutical ingredients, or food items, a whole lot of fuel items, multiple things can be got out from here. So currently the biotech market has a price value, in 2018 had a price value of $417 billion, but we are slowly inching or we are slowly moving into an area where this growth or this value is doubling and tripling. And by 2025, we, have, we would have a doubled market value depending on how we are moving. Okay. Because if your biofuel plants come up or 2G ethanol plants come up, this number would be much, much bigger because the consumption of enzymes would be of a scale that mankind has never used earlier. Or yeast cells, if we are used successfully, this would be really very huge. And it nowhere compares with what we currently use in the market. So, Kerif Group, Marlow Foods, and Nozymes, Syngenta, Royal, all these are a few other companies which are in the enzyme section. Now, why microbes matter? Microbes matter because they do all the jobs that you want them to do. I would say they are small, but they are mighty because one day if they decide not to do their jobs, you will have a lot of things piling up and a lot of our crops going bad, multiple things around us going out of order. Yes, they cause diseases, they cause decomposition, but the major thing that you need to remember is they drive the chemistry of life. And how do we use them? And why do we use them first? We use them because they grow fast, they can produce economically valuable compounds, large commercial productions can be done, eco-friendly, and they reduce the use of plants and animals. You can use it for human welfare. Misuse is also there, which leads to bio. The other, uh, what you say, the other actual lab applications are, they can be growing very fast. They can grow on a wide range of substrates. They are production houses of different kinds of molecules, large biomasses are possible. You can cultivate a huge number of them in a very short time. You can you modify them, genetically modify them for your different applications. So humankind from around 4000 BC has started understanding and using microorganisms for their benefit. Initially, it was brewery, bakery, different kinds of fermented drinks, 
But then towards the, towards the current century, we have large scale sewage purification that is happening. We have microbes which can be used for acetone and glycerol production. Penicillin was done by Alexander Fleming. So a whole lot of these applications have come, historic developments are there, and there is a lot of applications of biotechnology that we have. So if you, if I sum up the major areas of biotechnology, basically animal, plant, animal breeding, all these things, you somewhere, somehow, for the vaccine productions, the initial cloning is basically done in bacteria and then it is implemented into the larger, higher systems. For microorganisms themselves, we have a whole lot of applications that we can think of health applications, environment applications, and the plants also have their own. But this slide here has a different perspective that I want to bring. Now, when we are using microbe, animal, or plant for any of the improvisations that we do, or any of the modifications that we do, there is also an aspect of growing these cells in the laboratory, which is very crucial. This allows us to understand their requirements. This allows us to understand how they will grow further on. And there is a different set of applications where single cells are needed for propagation. So if you're looking at microbes, many of the microbes are prokaryotic systems and they are singular cells which we grow in the lab. But even animal cells and plant cells are grown in the lab for culturing purposes as well as for applications that you can think of. So if you're looking at having any of these organisms grown, what are the steps that you need to have? The first and the foremost step is isolation, isolation of organisms from the environment. Once this is done, then you have the screening methodologies, then you have the improvisation methodologies, then you have maintenance, mass culture, and finally recovery. So these are your steps of these are your steps of in white biotechnology that we usually use. Therefore, to adopt to white biotechnology, the primary requirement is to develop an Uh, professor, can you hear us? I think the connection is lost.
Hello, is my screen visible? Uh, yes, Professor. Yeah. So from the different environments, we basically, um, from the different environments, we basically try to isolate or pick up microorganisms of choice and isolate them on plates wherein they can be separated from the other organisms and cultivated further on. So for example, I'll give you an example. We want to screen fungal enzymes. For this, what we do is we collect and fungi or we collect soil sample from the environment. And then this soil sample, we use media or we use different kinds of growing, different kinds of environments where we can grow these fungi selectively. And once these fungi are selectively grown and we obtain something called as a pure culture, we then expose them to different kinds of um, substrates to identify which kind of substrates can be act upon. And once you select the kind of uh, specific fungi for their degradation as well as for their absorption characteristics, you then transfer them to a growth substrate or apply to them, them to the contaminated site so that you can have eco-friendly, reutilizable methodologies. So this is the kind of screening I'm talking about. Now here, what we have is, we have many different kinds of media in which we can screen the microorganisms selectively. Selectively would mean that we are using a material wherein your particular interest or your the organism which is producing enzyme of your particular interest is picked up and then it can be seen as a very distinct characteristic of that particular organism on a plate from where you can pick it up. Okay. For example, you have amylase negative cultures and amylase positive cultures. If you have a mileage positive cul negative culture on this starch plate, which is uh, loaded with iodine, you'll see it as a white column. But if it is a positive culture where the starch has got degraded and formed glucose, then this colony can give you a nice red halo, which indicates that this is a positive culture. So in this manner, you can have cellulose selective medium, you can have lacase selective medium, you have phosphatase, you have protease, any of the enzyme that you would want to see, we can basically, we can basically pick up the media accordingly and isolate. So that brings us to media for selection and isolation. So what is a cultured media? Simply in simple, in very simple words, these are basically nutrients which supply energy and they allow the microorganisms to grow and reproduce. Okay. Now in a natural <laughs> environment. Yes, is there any question? In a natural environment, microorganisms can be adapted to habitats most suitable for their needs, but laboratory, you have to provide them food to grow. So the food or the culture media that we use to grow is an aqueous solution where all the necessary nutrients have been added. And depending on the type and the combination of the nutrients, different categories of media can be made. So let's quickly look at why you use culture media. Use culture media so that you can provide the nutrition which is equivalent to the natural environment. You also use culture media so that you can understand characteristics and properties of the microorganism. And finally, we can allow the microorganism to produce the vaccine, toxoid, antigen, or secondary metabolite as per our requirement. So broadly, these are some of the some of the applications that we basically have for culture media and why the culture media becomes so crucial.
Now, when we are designing these culture medium, we have to keep the growth of the microorganism in mind. And what would you mean by growth of the microorganism? So one of the things that most of the media will satisfy would be the chemical requirements of the organism, the carbon source, the nitrogen source, if phosphorus is needed or any trace element is needed. You also for oxygen requirements. So if there are organisms which are highly aerobic, obligate anaerobes, anaerobic or facultative anaerobes, depending on their needs, the chemicals that are added to the media can be regulated. But in addition to this, what we have also to keep an eye on is the temperature, the pH in which the organism needs to grow. So having added the chemical requirements, then we need to do add buffers in the system. We need to understand which organism grows at which pH and temp temperature so that accordingly we can modify the requirements or modify the media so that it can allow these microorganisms to grow. Now there are chemically defined media or complex media. Now in these, in these differences, the, in chemically defined media, you basically control every carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, trace element. Everything is properly written on the data. Whereas when you have complex media, we just add one ingredient, which is thought to have all of these ingredients, which allow the medium to grow, organism to grow. Similarly, for anaerobes, we cannot give it an oxygen rich medium or we cannot allow it to grow in a system where you have ingredients which capture oxygen from the environment. We need to have a reducing medium or we need to have a special apparatus called the brewer jug where organisms can grow. Now, there are also other culture medium where we add egg or we add certain particular tissue or we add blood so that the organism is facilitated. Okay. One of the examples that I will give you here is if you want to isolate a microbe which is infecting blood or which causes um, infections in the blood, how do you identify them? These, these organisms can be hemolytic. They can damage the blood, red blood cells and cause a whole lot of problems. One of the methodologies of isolating these bacteria are you basically use blood agar plates. You pour a layer of blood on the plate so that you can identify microorganisms which can lyse, hemolyze red blood cells, thereby causing immense damage in the body. Similarly, we have microorganisms which produce lysozyme. Now, if you have egg or egg, multi, by egg white, egg yolk in the medium and the organism can digest that, then we conclude that these organisms produce some kind of protease which enables it to grow fast. Also, sometimes the micro media needs to be designed based on what kind of things we want to do. Do we want to see the growth curve of the microbe or do we want to understand how it is performing in the stationary phase or the lag and the log phase? Depending on all these requirements, the media components are designed. So basic components of any medium would be water, carbon source, nitrogen source, energy source, minerals and the special growth factors like vitamins. You can also have media in solid, semi-solid or liquid form based on the physical state. And you could have media based on components or ingredients that you add, synthetic or defined media, complex or undefined media, and special media. These are some of the types of media that you have. Now let's look at why defined and undefined. Now, in defined, as I told you earlier, known quantities of all ingredients would be there. You will know how much of carbon source is there, how much of nitrogen is there, whether your carbon is in the form of glucose or glycerol or maltose or any of the other carbon sources, sugar sources, 
or you have to take carbon dioxide from the environment. Many a times when you're growing algal cultures, we do not add carbon sources. We pump in or we bubble in carbon dioxide into the environment, from the environment. So that becomes the carbon source. The next important thing uh, is the nitrogen source. Now here in the nitrogen source, an identification of whether you are using inorganic nitrogen or you are using organic nitrogen is also crucial. So ammonium salts, nitrates, these are inorganic components. Sometimes people also prefer to use urea. But there are some organisms which will not use inorganic nitrogen. They would need organic nitrogen sources and will be able to grow on only those. So in those conditions, it becomes essential that we fine tune and tune it back to the organic nitrogen sources. Under the undefined organisms, we have complex ingredients. These consist of a mixture of many, many chemical species in unknown proportions. So for example, if I'm adding yeast extract, Yes, I add yeast extract for organic nitrogen source, but in addition to the organic nitrogen source, it may have carbon sources, it may have all the vitamins and multiple other things which are basically not listed out in the components. So you have complex ingredients. So for example, a chemical defined medium would mean that you have glucose in a fixed quantity, NH4, H2O, PO4 in a known quantity, NaCl, MgSO4, KH2PO4. So here all the chemical species that are going into the medium is properly defined. Whereas if I have an example of a complex medium, a complex medium basically is like peptone, beef extract, NaCl, agar, water. You do not know the chemical species in there. Apart from these two types of defined and undefined medium, we also have special media like enrichment media, selective media, differential media, transport media, anaerobic media. These different medium basically allow us to uh, facilitate the growth of organisms in a particular manner, in a particular condition. If I'm looking at enrichment medium, this would allow the growth of only one particular type of organism. So you usually add inhibitors or you add antibiotics to the system so that you do not allow other organisms to grow. This kind of enrichment medium is very popularly used when we know our target for isolation. So, I mean, long ago when I was doing my master's, we were interested in this halophile, which used to grow very fast. It had a, a replication time of just seven minutes. And the major advantage that we had with this culture was it used to grow very well at 5% 5% NaCl concentrations. So we designed a very simple experiment or we designed a simple media for this where we were using the normal, uh, normal uh, chemically defined medium. And in that, instead of adding five grams of NaCl, we would use, we would five grams of NaCl to around 10 liters. We would add five grams to 100 liters to make a 5% solution. So this basically allowed us to select that particular organism because none of the other organisms from that niche environment were able to grow at that pH, uh, sorry, at that salt concentration. And another property was it used to grow very fast. So within two hours, the culture was isolated and you could use it very easily. Okay. So these are enrichment medium wherein they are added in a, they are usually in a liquid me, liquid form and you inhibit other microorganisms and contaminating bacteria so that you get the choice of, your choice of bacteria here. Okay, some of the common inhibitors that are added, these are antibiotics, dyes, chemicals, pH alteration systems many of these combinations. So if you know one single property that 
your particular organism of choice has, you could selectively use these for your uh, improvisations. And examples include Lobinston's Jensen medium, serite F broth, tetrothionate broth, alkaline peptone broth, pseudocell agar. All these would be different kinds of examples. Then you have something called as a selective medium. This is basically used for growth of only selected microorganisms. Now here what we do is the selection is done by adding microorganisms which prevent the growth of cells or you are doing adding, removing certain amino acids which you know are not needed by the organism of your choice but all other organisms would need. You also add stains and color indicators here like EMB, EMB agar, which is used for selectively picking up microorganisms infecting the gut of human beings. Okay. For lacking of amino acids, when we are doing um, molecular biology, we use certain amino acid traits which are there in our cloned organism so that we can select that cloned organism above all the others. Then we have differential, differential medium. Uh, in differential medium, it is it's the same plate that is growing, but it distinguishes one organism from the other. The color, shape, growth pattern, all will differ. And you have, you can make out two different organisms from the same environment. So dyes that are added like EOC, methylene, two agar, then you have differential, um, plates, media for lactose sucrose fermentation, like McConkey's agar, where organisms that uh, ferment lactose are differently colored and organisms that ferment glucose are differently colored. Similarly, you have for lactose medium, you have MSA, that is mantle salt agar, which is again a differential medium that we have. So when we are looking at media for isolating microorganisms, we have all these uh, weapons in our repertoire and we selectively pick up medium depending on what we want to isolate from the environment. Isolate would mean what we want to pick up from the environment. So depending on the type of organisms to be isolated from the natural habitat, different media can be choosed, chosen. So first and foremost for isolating bacteria, we use a general medium. And once on that general medium, everything grows, then we basically go forward for specific selective mediums. Now, the uh, media that we use for isolating bacteria are very different from the ones that we would use for isolating yeasts and fungi or the ones that are used for isolating actinomycins. Here, one principal thing that goes, underlines these things, these uh, selections of media are Bacteria usually grow very fast. They utilize glucose and grow very fast. On the contrary, they do not have uh, complex enzymes, you know, for digesting the huge polysaccharides in there. Or they are very slow when you have to digest polysaccharides. So we use up these principles where we design medium depending on the fact that it can di digest sugar fast and will grow fast. So you in provide enough of protein source with soluble sugar so that the entire organism can grow fast. However, while isolating fungi, we use a different strategy. We use complicated medium or we use a complex medium where, wherein your bacteria will not thrive. And this allows us to isolate yeast and fungi, wherein a longer period of time is usually needed for their growth. So we have a yeast extract, potato, peptone, dextrose medium, which is commonly used for growing yeast. Then we have potato dextrose agar, which is a common growth medium for fungi. Then we have sabroids dextrose agar, which is for subculturing of fungi recovered from the enriched meat. When we move to actinomycetes, these are still slow growing organisms, much slower than even the yeast. And for these organisms, we have other sets of agars or other set, sets of media which are selective for these organisms. I mean, I'll quickly take you through an example of a work 
which we had done way back in 2017, where we had looked at rotting seaweeds from, uh, this was an uh, it was a collaborative project with Aberystwyth University, where one of our students had gone over to Aberystwyth to do this study. And in this study, we had picked up fresh and rotting weeds from the Aberystwyth coast and isolated roughly around 849 organisms individually from these systems. Okay. So there were four strategies used for the work. In two strategies, we were looking at aerobic bacteria and two of the strategies, we were looking at anaerobic bacteria. So for the two strategies where we were looking at aerobic bacteria, one of the things that we did was just took the weeds and grind, ground them properly and plated it out onto first level plates. The second strategy that we used was we incubated these leaves into uh, enrichment medium and allowed the bacteria to be enriched and then plated them out on the ground. So what you see here are tiny leaves, macerated leaves that are directly put on the plate. And once the plate showed a group of uh, organisms growing around this, the whole agar was cut and then inoculated into liquid medium for further enrichment. And once it was enriched there, then we isolated it on fields that you see. So this allowed us to isolate 367 organisms from the fresh ulva and 482 organisms from the rotting ulva species, making it a total of 849 organisms. Now, when we did all these, I mean, what was the purpose of isolating this? The purpose of isolating these were we wanted to look at enzyme uh, properties or enzymes that these organisms made. So the next step that we did was you, we inoculated these onto selective medium where only the microorganisms producing the enzymes could produce a zone of clearance or could show a zone of uh, enhanced color, thereby allowing us to pick up those organisms and use them further on in our experiments. So for ulvan lysis, we had 166 positives. For the carbohydrate sulfatases, 27. Then for uh, endocellulases, we had around 60. And for uh, beta glucosidase, 68. And for the exosynthesis, around 16 more. So totally, we had 29 distinct organisms that were pro producing this. So the organisms were further identified using 16S RNA sequence and then taken further for active. But the life does not stop here. If we want to take it further, to implementation, we basically need to work with these samples further on and mutate them and isolate the functional uh, mutants and assay them in different. So what you see here is the first set of plates where you are isolating the organisms. The second set of plates where you are selecting, selectively looking at the ones that you are interested in. And once you isolate this, then you come to a third set of media where you are testing its potential. And the fourth set of media is differentiating them from what you have from the other sets. So a good producer, a bad producer, all these will be differentiated. So these are four different kinds of media that we are using. And further on, when we want to go ahead, then we pick up these uh, organisms, then you isolate their genes and clones, and you go ahead and look for cloning of this. This is uh, the next part of your work. But life doesn't stop even after we isolate the protein or you pick up a best performer. The activity which is associated towards industrial biotechnology actually starts at that point after we have picked up a strain which shows promise. Now from that strain, we need to get the product of interest. So for that, we use growth media and there are two types of growth medias. One is a growth media where you have low amounts of nutrients, but you create raw material for further fermentation. And then you have fermentation medium, which contains high amounts of nutrients, and you are looking at final products to be formed. So for growth, for example, growth medium for yeast requires 1% carbon. 
But if you are looking at fermentation of alcohol, alcohol is the final product. The yeast, we need to give the yeast almost 10 to 13 to 15 percent of carbon in the medium so that it can go further. Very classical example is sugarcane juice has around 14 percent sugar in it. And this 14 percent sugar is being given to yeast strains in a particular medium so that they can convert that sugar into alcohol. So that is the difference between a growth medium and a fermentation. A growth medium will never contain such high levels of carbon, but a fermentation medium or a production medium will definitely contain high states so that you can have higher quantity of carbs that are formed. The next that we come to is looking at why fermentation medium and growth medium are so different. Fermentation medium, we are looking at the microorganism to grow and also satisfy its nutritional requirements, but also allow it so that you can have a higher production. The fermentation medium should be able to give maximum yield, minimum yield of undesired product, consistent availability through the year, and it should be cheap in different products. So when we are formulating a medium for the manufacturing process, we look at carbon, nitrogen, energy source, oxygen, nutrients, all of which are very crucial for the growth of the organism. And then at the end of it, we should have the biomass, that is cells that are grown enough. The product of interest has to be in a high concentration. Carbon dioxide, water and heat, all of these are taken to it needs to be, there needs to be a mass balance between what is coming in and what is going out from the system. The elemental composition of the microbe is usually considered as a guide here when we are designing our medium. So for a systematic approach in fermentation medium in designing, we basically have a database which has, which, in which the C by N ratios or the inducers are taken from the literature. You do a component screening based on the costs of the material. You have a series of experiments wherein you decide which is the significant C by N sources that you can use. And once you have taken these sources, you add in into a design of experiment format and shortlist the components that are being used into a at the shake flask level, and once the shake flask level is done, you optimize it through statistic design, and then you evaluate your results, and then pick up the core elements and move to the fermenter, fermenter's runs. And even in the fermenter runs, you pick up the new medium, you do uh, optimization experiments, and finally narrow down on the medium that is used. In the event of time, I'll just move forward. So here again, we have in the fermentation medium, we have two types of media, synthetic media and crude media. Synthetic media, we would design the whole synthetic media depending on the final product. And here, everything would be predetermined. Whatever composition of nutrients is going in would be predetermined. Such synthetic media are usually used for food, pharma applications where the end product needs to be highly pure and you need to account for every ingredient that has gone. On the contrary, you have crude media, which is a rough composition of medium that we use. It gives, it may be able to give you a very high yield of product. The criteria is that because you do not know individual components of the uh, material that is going in many a times, it may have toxic products and other material which you need to be careful about. In synthetic media, you have multiple advantages in that it is uh, very properly designed. There will be no foam formation, chances of contamination would be less, your product recoveries can be easier, but cost becomes a major deterrent here. And the fermentation should be economic and profitable. Synthetic media, usually people don't use at an industrial scale because it is expensive unless there is a need for a very fine product. 
In the crude media, we look at inorganic nutrients. You have carbon sources, nitrogen sources, growth factors, precursor molecules, buffers that we add. And all these individual components, they come together to give you the biomass growth in a very nice manner. But it needs to be recognized that sometimes you may get growth, but that doesn't mean that you will get the final product in the desired quantity. So you need to be very attentive here whether the growth medium and your production medium need to be the same at all points of time or there are some properties for produ production of your product that are different and cannot be done using the growth medium. So that would be the time where you decide to differentiate or separate the two activities where you're growing in the medium first, making enough biomass and then moving to the next factor. You have a whole lot of uh, designing experiments, statistical tools for designing like blackett bowman and multiple other methods where you can pick up your variables and do a view. However, more recently, people are using automation in media designing where only 1.1 or 1% of estimated numbers of the organism are, have been successfully grown. But people or researchers are developing computational modeling to support culturing and efforts. And this has led to a media DB that is a database of growth microbial growth conditions in defined medium, which can be accessed on the net and used for designing. So here you have a very simplified schema, wherein organisms, the properties of organisms, the biomass that you need with the resources, the media names, the growth conditions, compound that you're looking at, and the media components are all based in a program by, whereby you can get your DB. This brings together literature sources of experimentally verified media formulations and you have a chemically defined medium so that every compound can be linked to a metabolic pathway. The links with compound identifiers are also there and they are simple repeatable automated cross-linking formats. It focuses on organisms with existing in silico models. And therefore, once you have in silico models, then you could provide multiple media conditions to support this in silico models. This serves as a set for organism specific media and it includes only species that are fully sequenced. So unknown species cannot be processed through this. And that therefore brings us to artificial intelligence in media optimization where people are trying to use AI and achieve a whole range of techniques from the classical one factor at a time to modern artificial neural networks and genetic algorithm mechanisms. So here, if you see, there are two ways of optimizing media. One is the traditional one factor method that we do, one factor method at a time, and you have advanced methodologies where in you have screening of significant components and optimization of the component composite concentration through RSM, ANM, GA, and fuzzy logic methodologies. However, there are some bottlenecks in this entire process. Media optimization usually is labor intensive, and there are a lot of experiments that people need to do with open-ended experiments. The generated data from the shake flask and the fermenter studies may not match sometimes. And this is one of the major drawbacks of doing this studies. We cannot perform all the fermenter studies because the volumes are higher and the resources are very stringent here. And that's the reason why people do shake flask studies or micro, small microbioreactor studies. The best medium that is obtained in the shake flask will be the best medium in the fermenter. That is what we make, the primary assumption that we make. Unfortunately, many rigorous studies in this have to be carried out so that we can establish this line of thought. 
some preliminary things that we need to keep in mind before we set out for this exercise of designing media is that cells are dynamic in nature. And you cannot treat them as black boxes. You have to understand their internal control mechanisms so that you can design the medium which will give us the output that is desired. And designing media is not an end point. The yield is arbitrary and you need to keep modifying conditions to reach to the final output product which may seem lucrative. Most of the experts always are on the lookout for new components to increase the yield. Some future perspectives here, you have different formulations that we need to do and therefore carbon and nitrogen sources always need to be researched upon. There is precision that is needed and in the present condition, sometimes microbes cannot use cheaper sources, but you need to adapt them and tune them through mutation to assimilate low cost substrates with better performance. So with that, I close my uh, session. This is the place where I belong to, the DBT Center for Energy Biosciences. We basically have biologists, chemists, and chemical engineers working towards industrial microbiology and industrial biotechnology aspects. And thanks a lot for your time and attention. Over to you, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Arnab. Uh, students? Uh, we open the session for questions. If you need any clarifications, you can ask Professor. Good morning, ma'am. Um, I have a doubt. Yes. Ma'am, you talked about enhanced coloration um, and when you isolated around 800, 800 organisms from a rock. Hmm. So ma'am, I'm a little uh, confused as to how the enhanced coloration works. See, it is not enhanced coloration that we are talking about. We basically isolate organisms and pick up individual microorganisms. Now these individual microorganisms may produce enzymes with different intensities. And that intensity is what we are looking for. So when we, why do we do these experiments of isolation? Is to pick up the best performer. How do we pick up the best performer? Is by how much of enzyme does it produce? And the enzyme production is directly correlated with the color that is produced. In some cases, the substrate In some cases, the substrate may be broken down into a product which does not have color. So you have either a zone of clearance or a zone of intensified color, depending on the choice of the substrate that you make. Okay. And in that manner, then we pick up the best performer. Okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I got it. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. Any other questions? Good morning, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, what are the energy sources which are required in uh, culture media? So we usually, what are the energy sources? So my question is to you first. What are the energy sources you need? Can you tell me an energy source that you need every morning? I'm the food, mainly the carbon content. Yeah, so microorganisms also need carbon to grow. So in addition to carbon, see, you just cannot live on carbon. You cannot live on bread alone. You need to fortify it with nitrogen. Okay. Why do yes, people say that banana is a rich source of, immediate source of energy? Because it has carbon, that is the sucrose. It also has other minute elements or nutrients which support it. 
and be, therefore it becomes an instant source of energy. So when you have microorganisms or you have to pick up microorganisms, you need to give them a source of energy so that they outgrow in comparison to how they would grow in a natural environment. Okay, so this kind of selectivity comes in only when you are giving a particular nitrogen source to enhance its properties. Does that answer your question, Rohan? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, anybody else? Think no more questions. Yeah, I'm sorry for extending that lecture. Bye. Uh, it's okay. We still have some time. Yeah, thanks so uh, much. You can share me the PPT, then I will pass it to the students. Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thanks so much. Bye. Uh, Dr. Pranav, you have. Yes, I am here. Yes, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning Dr. Yes. Uh, yes. Students, uh, we'll start, continue with the next session. Uh, we have with us Dr. Pranav <laughs> Nanda Bhattacharya, uh, who is presently working as an assistant professor in NNS College, uh, Dilberga University. Okay. Uh, he earlier to uh, <coughs> he was working as a scientist C in mycology and microbiology department at uh, Toklai T Research Associate Institute uh, T Research Association ASAM. Uh, he has also done a postdoctoral in ICAR uh, during 2012. Uh, he has uh, academic experiences as lecturer of two provisionalized college in ASAM, and he is a two-time gold medalist at graduation and post graduation <coughs> in botany from. Uh, Gauhati University. He also did his PhD from Gauhati University, Assam, uh, specializing in microbial ecology and bioprospecting. Uh, his present area of research is microbial ecology, bioprospecting, metagenomics, uh, soil microbiology, agricultural uh, microbiology, behavior of microbes, plant pathogen interactions, uh, microbial mapping, adoption of non chemical and organic uh, approaches in agriculture. Uh, he has received uh, several awards like National Merit Scholarship, Gold Medalist from Universities, Professor A.C. Dutta Memorial Award, Best Researcher Award from International Scientist Award, 2020-20 uh, on Engineering, Science and Medicine. Uh, he has also got Sadhana Young Achiever Award, BioWorld uh, Young Scientist Award. He is a member of uh, Association of Microbiologists of India. He has recently joined as a project collab uh, coordinators with the esteemed International Asia Pacific Network for developing research projects for promoting agroecological practices uh, for improving soil health and productivity. He has published more than 50 number of research articles in different uh, national and international journals. He has also published two books in philophane, entitled Philophane, uh, Microflora in Certain Tea Cultivars of Assam, Northeast India, and Exploiting Their Potential for Use in Tea, and Actinorhizal Plants, uh, okay, Elegans Latifolia Conservation. He has guided a number of undergraduate students from different academic organizations throughout India for short-term uh, research works and dissertation. Uh, Okay, with this uh, short introduction, uh, I invite uh, Professor Datta. But I said, yes. Yes, a yeah, very uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, at the outset, I uh, uh, convey my sincere thanks to Srishti Bairak uh, for selecting me to means uh, provide some lectures in this uh, very igniting session. Last year also I have given some lectures. So uh, now time has already been run. So I will now start my presentation, I think. Yes. Sir. So, yes, yes. So I'm now sharing my uh, slides. Okay.
I think it is visible, na? No? Participants. Ah, uh, uh, yes, professor. Yes, yes, yes. So now I will start. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, this work is basically on uh, using some sustainable approaches. Okay, so sustainable approaches means we all know that what is happening uh, in our agriculture or in a, any kind of uh, suppose uh, agricultural system. So there are different kinds of agricultural systems. So what is happening? We have used uh, means uh, uh, decades means uh, different kinds of chemicals. So different kinds of pesticides, different kinds of other some chemical supplements. And what is happening? Our soils are getting worse day by day. So uh, that's why we have to have uh, get some strategies to remedy uh, to remedy the our soil conditions to uh, means increase or enhance our plant productivity and to improve the plant protection capabilities by using some sustainable approaches. Otherwise, what will happen in the next uh, few decades? Our soil will means entirely will be ruined, or our plant production will not be so sufficient enough to feed our the entire growing populations. So that's why this presentation is totally uh, today is based on actually basically based on for the production of some sustainable bio fertilizers. So how can we do this sustainable bio fertilizer production by using our uh, immense potential of microbial resources? So this basic uh, topic title is basically putting microbes to work. So we are using microorganisms here. So we are using microorganisms here for the production of some quality materials or, from, or, or we can say that uh, for production of some quality substances or some I uh, means uh, compost or this have been applied it to agricultural system and we are uh, means we are observing their effects. So which uh, I have included here as I'm as I belongs to basically from tea ecosystem, I have a char tea industry uh, in the last uh, five to six years. So I have done some experiments in tea ecosystem. Therefore, tea has been included here as a role means a system for seeing this uh, whole concept. So now uh, you all know that uh, what is happening. Now I am slide sharing. Yes. Yes, so we all know that nutrients are needed. So nutrients are needed. So there are different kinds of nutrients. These nutrients are needed for growing plants, not only for plants, we, are, we also get nutrients. No? From morning to night, we get some kinds of food materials. No? So uh, likewise, the plants also need the nutrients. And these nutrients are basically what? So there are different kinds of actually Doctor, elemental form. Doctor, yes. yes, the slides are not moving. It is still not in moving. the first slide, yes. Okay, here it is moving. Yeah. Here it is moving. Now? now? No, no, no. No. Now? Uh, now, now it is moving. Okay, yes. okay, okay, okay. Please uh, tell if it is moving or not now. Yeah. Here, now? It, it is in the second slide. Okay, it is? Second slide, second slide. Now, now? No, it's not moving. It's not moving. Why it is happening? So it is moving? Yeah. Yeah, now now it is working. Okay, then then okay, okay. Moving it is? Okay. Uh, yes, okay. Yes, sir. okay, okay. So these nutrients, uh, so whatever we done nutrients, so these nutrients, so these are basically some elements. So they have been considered, you all know that there are some micro macronutrients, there are some micronutrients, and then some secondary nutrients. These nutrients are basically essential for normal growth, development, uh, and reproduction in plants. So this, without the help of these nutrients, the plant uh, means uh, they are unable to, means, uh, uh, means uh, they are run their life cycles. No? So these nutrients are basically needed for their entire growth cycle. So you all know different kinds of nutrients, the nitrogen is required, phosphorus, potassium, these are some macronutrients. So these nutrients are required for the formation of proteins, nucleic acids, then phosphorus is required for the formation of nucleic acids, then ATP generation, okay, phospholipids, then this potassium is also required for energy activations, then activation of the different kinds of enzymes, and then sulfur besides calcium, we all know that 
this micro besides this macronutrients there are also some micronutrients and there are some secondary nutrients so which are also required for means conducting or for performing the normal activities of plants without the, the without the need of nutrients or without the proper supply of this type of nutrients the roots of the plants cannot grow properly the leaves of the plants cannot grow properly okay and we all know that there is a, there is a very vital process in our living system and that is our photosynthesis no? so in case of photosynthesis what happens we all know that uh, the carbon dioxide which is basically uh, means uh, pro, means uh, uh, means uh, it is taken from the atmosphere and it gets means uh, associated from means with water which is taken by the plant roots and as a, as a result of which the green plants can do photosynthesis and with the help of this photosynthesis process the green plants can produce the glucose this is the entire food this is the main food for the entire living world so the plants also get benefited from this for entire energy generation and then by eating the plants or by using the plant products we are also getting with the human beings enter animals so they are also getting that means what we are getting nutrients that's that's what happens that nutrients the previous slide which shows that the nutrients that are basically uh, they have been procured or they have been uh, generated from different process and this is also required for the process of photosynthesis so then we know that nutrient deficiency in plants happens no? so whenever there are some nutrient deficient conditions so plants suffer means uh, different kinds of problems or so different kinds of problems has been encountered in case of plants like yellow yellowing of leaves then yellow or brown leaf edges holes in leaves there are different kinds of holes forms in leaves okay then leaves becomes burned then dropping takes place leaf dropping from the plants so these are some nutrient deficiency symptoms whenever there means uh, not sufficient amount of nutrients is available in the soil so then this type of phenomena happen yellowing of the veins yellowing of the means uh, uh, leaf veins that leaves so there are lots of deficiency problem in relation to different nutrient conditions so now what happens actually so does we come to know that nutrients are very much more essential for growing plants so nitrogen phosphorus calcium boron these are also some micronutrients okay then uh, nickel then copper so these nutrients are required for normal plant growth and development okay but what is happening these nutrients are naturally occurring also in case of soil okay so these nutrients normally i means uh, their occurrence is in soil but what happens when the nutrient level is low sometimes the nutrient level becomes very low because of the, their short supply because of their reuses or because of their uses by the plants or they in that case the plant cannot function properly that means this is the nutrient stress conditions or nutrient less conditions and as a result of which what is happening there is also every need for refilling of soil nutrients so this is the actually uh, parameter why the farmers have to use or the farmers have to depend on some fertilizers okay so because although the nutrients are in soil but due to our cropping system or due to the uses by the plants uh, so at one moment the uh, means uh, the soil gets starved with the nutrients so that's why we have to add the fertilizer so fertilizers are simply nothing but there are some plant nutrients so these nutrients whenever applied to the agricultural soils they have the potential to enrich the means productivity of the plants so and they can also naturally they can also be means uh, adopted in the soil conditions then fertilizers so these fertilizers they may be either of two sources so they may be either natural fertilizers or they may be either some synthetic or chemical fertilizers so now uh, what is natural fertilizer so natural fertilizers means it is we all know that this is actually basically organic sources okay so they may be either some soil amendments so what are soil amendments so uh, soil amendments is nothing but so these are some materials which have been whenever they can be added to the soil they can improve the soil physical properties soil chemical properties so some soil physical properties like water retention capabilities permeability means increase then water filtration infiltration capacities then drainage problems they can sort out the drainage problems and they can solve the drainage problems aeration proper aeration so these type of substances suppose one of the important example is biosar 
So they have to be added. So these are basically some natural fertilizers. Then our today's topic is concerned on some organic means fertilizers or manures. So these are a compost basically. So I will, in the next uh, slides, I will explain how we can do uh, this compost or microbial enriched compost or how we can use the microbes for sustain for production of sustainable fertilizer. So manure, compost, animal excreta, they can be, okay? So they can be uh, organic fertilizers. Then another thing is that synthetic or chemical fertilizers. So we all know that chemical fertilizers or chemical substances, that is, uh, they are rich in nitrogenous sources, then phosphatic fertilizers, they may be either potassium fertilizers. So there are different types, okay? So these fertilizers, urea, we you know, ammonium nitrate. So these are all some chemical fertilizers. They can also play an important role in enriching the what? Soil nutrients or soil nutrient uptake, okay? So, but what is happening? Thus, we can, likewise, when we uh, means classify these fertilizers as organic or natural fertilizers and then chemical fertilizers, likewise, we can also classify the pesticides up to basically two categories. That is your biological pesticides and then chemical pesticides. So bio pesticides are basically, they are microbial bio pesticides. No? So we can use lots of microorganisms like bacteria, fungus, actinomyces, okay, viruses. So they can be used for the production of some bio pesticides. So these are basically from biological sources. So botanicals can also serve as a bio pesticides. Okay. So, but chemical pesticides, basically these are of different types, organic clarins, then these are of carbamates, pyrethroids, then sulfur, urines. So these, these all also some other kinds of pesticides. So these uh, pesticides are basically added to the soil or these pesticides are basically added in the agricultural system in order to protect the plants from different kinds of what? Pests, it may be either insect, sucking insect or other kinds of insects or some pathogens, okay? So now what is happening? Why we should move for some sustainable approaches? This is today's question. So why should we go? We have chemical fertilizers, but why should we go for some organic fertilizers or sustainable strategies or some uh, uh, other alternative sources, non-chemical sources, okay? So why we should move it? Because you all know that chemicals are always harmful, okay? Chemicals, it may be either chemical fertilizers or it may be either chemical pesticides. So they play an important role while deteriorating our air and groundwater pollution. So they can, pro they, they can create lots number of residues or they can, pro they can, they can uh, produce a number of means chemical elements and whenever they get deposited in the air and groundwater systems, so they can ultimately pollute the entire environment. So they, they play an important role in soil contamination. They have been known for their quality deterioration. The entire soil fertility becomes, means uh, very uh, detrimental effects due to the application continuous or rapid use of, or illegitimate and excessive use of this type of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. So ultimately our soil becomes sick. And uh, then another thing is that biodiversity, we all know whenever our uh, entire ecosystem Whenever we are applying lot number of excessive uh, amount of toxic chemicals, so it, it plays an important role in reducing our plant diversity, then our birds diversity, natural enemies, butterflies, and lot other means, uh, uh, means uh, insects, which are also helpful for the ecosystem, okay? So it, these pesticides or chemicals, they play an important role in reducing the nitrogen fixation in their long-term applications. Then pollinator decline and death then plays an important role in killing the but birds, butterflies, natural enemies, threatens and then species. Then one of the most important problem is chemical resistance in pests and pathogens. So now while working in the ecosystem, we, we come to know one, one situation or we are in one situation that uh, the diseases or pests which were, which were not severe, okay? So before two decades, so they are now becoming severe in recent decades. So there are two important diseases in tea, Fusarium dieback and red rust disease. Basically I am from microbiology. So Fusarium dieback disease and red rust disease, which were previously not effective till 2004, but now in Northeast India, tea cultivations, these two diseases are becoming more and more, very much more. They are very much more, I means uh, deteriorous 
to the tea ecosystem. They can even at the peak, uh, their infestation periods, they can uh, they can uh, even lose up to seventy six percent crop loss. So see the devastations. No? So what is happening actually? Long time from long time uh, means uh, the uh, means uh, growers are using the pesticides without there any limit. So this actually pro created problems in actually production of chemical toxicity or chemical resistance. So these pests and uh, means uh, different kinds of animals means uh, pests and pathogens they becomes very much more resistant. Then this is my development in plants. I have already explained. And then one of the most important problem is. Uh, one of the most important problem is lethal and sublethal effects to non-target organisms, including human beings. So this entirely creates problems uh, in causing lethal and uh, means uh, very de deadly effects to the living organisms like human beings. So entirely this uh, application of chemicals, this is also not cost effective. Okay, it is not cost effective. So. Uh, this is uh, the uh, means uh, I'm showing the pesticide cycle. You see, we are applying pesticides. They are get absorbed by the crops and they are also getting leaching to the soil conditions, okay? And they get uh, surface runoff. Then they are getting deposited in the nearby lakes, rivers, water bodies, and ultimately they are causing lots of problems. And ultimately again, our uh, means what is happening? They are get, again go, going to, going for it means vaporization and they are getting deposited in our cloud systems and ultimately gain rainfall. And again, we are getting these chemical toxicants in our environment. So uh, these are the getting, I mean, uh, or sending effects of lots of these chemical pesticides in agricultural system. So now what is happening? Uh, these uh, chemicals, why they are basically, uh, why they are basically harmful. So these chemicals or chemical supplements, whatever be the tea ecosystem or it may be either agricultural system, they are, very much more toxicants because they are persistent. Then they can bioaccumulate and they can biomagnify. So uh, these are basically toxicants they can build up in our bodies and tissues. Okay. So persistent, persistent toxicants. So uh, they, they are considered as chemicals are considered as persistent toxicants because uh, uh, they can they can even resist their breakdown. Okay. So they can resist their breakdown in presence of environmental factors like sunlight. Whenever there are excessive sunlight also, excessive temperatures also in the field conditions, so they will never break down. So ultimately what will happen? They are creating residue problems in our, what? So final finished products, okay? So then one is important problem is bioaccumulation. So bioaccumulation, we all know that whenever the chemical toxicants are ingested or they are inhaled, by us, so they are causing lots of uh, means. Uh, they are causing a very important means uh, problem, and it is known as bioaccumulations. And then biomagnification whenever they enter in our food chain. So our entirely food chain getting disrupts, and our the entire organisms. We all know food chain and food webs. No? So lots of organisms are getting interconnected with each other no? for energy sources. So all the animals are adversely affected with the with these applications of chemicals, okay? So another important problem, we all know chemicals and uh, means uh, climate change. No? So these chemicals, so what is happening? So they our, our environment is getting abrupt day by day. We all are getting down noticed. No? So our environment is getting abrupted from day by day. So we have adverse flood conditions, drought conditions, fire conditions. No? So these chemicals, whenever they are getting applied in our agricultural systems, our climate is becoming warmer and warmer day by day. And in the warmer climate conditions, what will happen actually? So the pests problems becomes also more severe because the pest normally favors the warmer conditions. Okay, so now whenever there will be a severity in the pest, so again, there is the application of pesticides. So now the situation you can assume that whenever we use the lots of pesticides, to defend the pests problems in any kind of agricultural system. So ultimately our environment or our climate is getting worsening day by day. So ultimately greenhouse effects, global warming, acid rain formation. So these are the major means side effects or major effects, direct effects from the application of chemicals in agricultural systems or any kind of industry. So likewise, if we see the tea ecosystem, what is happening in tea ecosystem, so in the ecosystem in the last 40 years, so lots of soil compaction problems have been happening. 
soil erosion problems have been happening, land degradations has been happening. So this they are enter means one of the important cause has been identified is that application of chemicals either in the so either in the way of chemical fertilizers or in the way of chemical pesticides. So soil degradation has been happening day by day. There is a loss of fertility, then soil salinity, it is getting affected, and then localized water problems has been happening. And these localized water problems, whenever that is happening, actually what is happening? The plants, plants, plants are unable to get their and uh, means uh, required amount of nutrients from the from their cultivated soil conditions. Okay. So fertility loss, predator and natural enemies, natural enemies, we all know that these are beneficial to us, but these natural enemies getting affected. Then contamination of the nearby water bodies, air pollution, okay? So plants getting in stress. Ultimately, what will happen? These all results the plants in stress. And whenever the plants in stress, there is every possibilities of pest and disease infestations. So resistance development in pests, I have already mentioned because of due to application of chemicals, warmer situations are there. So more amount of pesticides are applied, okay? So creation of undesirable residues and maximum residue limits as a result of which our tea, whenever we, get, we are getting sold to some, we regularly got some news that uh, foreign countries are also sometimes uh, uh, rejected our means uh, tea products. Na? So this is one of the important problem is that MRL. So does make tea contamination residue problems. So ultimately these are basically due to application of chemicals. So these chemicals are nothing but these are man-made interventions. Na? So thus they are causing abrupt effects to uh, means uh, deteriorate the soil quality and fertility loss and ultimately plant productivity and quality of the finished products. So if we assume a tea bush, okay? So this is uh, basically a tea bush. So there are lots of pest problems uh, basically encountered in the tea, tea bush. So these are some of the uh, insect problems or pest problems in tea. So this uh, pest, so they are getting more severe and severe due to application of these chemicals from the long decades. So similarly, we, I have mentioned that due to application of chemicals, the plants getting in stress. No? And this stress factor is also another important reason for the weakness of the plants. And as a result of which there are some diseases, there are some diseases. So these diseases, so these diseases have also been getting more and more severe in case of tea plants. So normally in case of tea diseases, whenever we discuss about the tea diseases, so tea has basically two types of diseases. That is primary diseases and the secondary diseases. So primary diseases and secondary diseases, whatever be the diseases, we all know that diseases are caused by some pathogens, okay? But in case of tea diseases, primary diseases, they are caused due to some direct effect of the pathogens, means spontaneously or some pathogens directly come and then they can affect the plants. But in case of secondary disease development, some predisposing factors, means predisposing factor means there may be some water problems, water logging problems. There may be uh, some problems related to actually uh, what? Uh, there are pH problems, okay? There are some potash nutrient deficiency problems. So due to these problems, actually what is happening? So some secondary disease development has also been getting or sending day by day. And this chemical applications. So this is considered as one of the most important secondary problems, okay? And then gray blight, brown blight, that's what I will not discuss in detail their symptoms, but I am discussing this slide as to give some idea, you some idea that the stress related factors, they are also, I mean, play important role for the development of more and more number of, I mean, pathogen infestations in the tea industry, okay? So now we have no other alternatives than to move to sustainability development. So we have to go for sustainability development. We have to adopt and specialize some um, means non-chemical, uh, means uh, sustainable approaches to means save our agricultural system. And this is the strategies for non-chemical nutrient management approach for means uh, loading the source of our nutrients, okay? By reducing the load of chemical supplements. So this has also been mentioned, you know, that United Nations 2015 Sustainable Development Goals. So there are some key, key headings where chemical applications has been briefly means or uh, they have been elaborated actually uh, for their harmful activities and why we should limit their or we should reduce their load in our system. Okay, so this is the sustainability development goals. So now 
what we can do for agricultural sustainability. So for agricultural sustainability, I have already mentioned that uh, nutrients are needed for normal growth and development, reproduction activities for the plants. So nutrients are needed, okay? But we are now supplying the nutrients or we are now uh, developing some strategies to develop or to some, you introduce some non-chemical or biological or sustainable approaches, okay? So for provision or for product or for means provision of, means getting nutrients to the plants, okay? So this is your agricultural sustainability and quality manure production through production of quality manure. So how we can produce the quality manure? So this is the today's actually basic lecture session. So kinetics in organic matter decomposition. So we have lots of organic matter in our, uh, means in our uh, uh, surrounding. Suppose if you assume a tea ecosystem, there are lots of uh, means organic matters, organic matters in our system. So they can be uh, used, okay? If they can be used properly with the addition of some means alternative sources like biological non-chemical approaches. So they can be converted to some suitable or sustainable biofertilizers, and they can be well applied it instead of, or in order to reduce the load of chemicals. So by applying this uh, sustainable approaches, we can reduce the load of chemicals. So we can does we can use cellulose degrading microorganisms. Okay, so these cellulose degrading microorganisms, so they are basically active on cellulose materials like agro waste or agro plant biomass products, no? wheat biomass, this type of things, and we have also some potent warm species, some efficient warm species are dear. So they can be well utilized. If they can be well utilized, so this uh, consortium or this uh, means biological sources, they can actually convert the inorganic sources of their means uh, up to usable forms. So they can play an important role as potent drivers for organic matter decomposition. And the same means the quality compost, which is developed after this composting activity or these biotransformation activities, they may be utilized as quality organic manure in enhancing soil fertility, crop yield, plant protection against a number of significant pest and pathogen attack, which I have mentioned in my previous slides, okay? So now agricultural waste decomposition. We all know agricultural waste, agro-based wastes, they may be either rice straw, they may be either waste, say, tree loops in case of tea ecosystem, okay? Then with biomass, it is available in all kinds of agricultural system. Then pruning litter, it may be decomposed wood nearby areas, vegetables, kitchen vegetables, and then water hyacinth. So they may be used as a, what? So biotransformation products. So these microorganisms, they have cellulose degrading microorganisms, they have enough potential to convert these sources for their quality, means manure production, or you can say sustainable biofertilizers, and which whenever added to soil conditions, so they can enrich the carbon content, they can enrich the nitrogen content, they can enrich the phosphorus content in soil, and other soil physiological properties can also be enhanced due to application of this organic biofertilizers. So now this is the microbial approach. So this microbial approach, so the cellulose degraders, they have some identification parameters. I will show you some slides also, our original works. And then these cellulose, basically cellulose degraders, they are, they are basic substrate is cellulose, okay? So this cellulose is a, you know, linear polysaccharides. So these cellulosic materials, they actually, uh, our lots of agro-based uh, products like wheat biomass, plant biomass, crop residues, they contain 40 to 50% cellulose. And so this cellulose has been, may, it may be converted by this cellulose degrading microorganisms to that usable form. So however, in our developing countries like India, most of the agro-based products have, are never been utilized for their proper utilization in the means agricultural sector. So recently, uh, Mr. Modi, our prime minister, honorable prime minister have introduced some power plants, okay, in every stations of the India. So he will launch some power plants already launched uh, some of them. So for by means uh, power generation of this, uh, means uh, these decomposition activities. So this is a very uh, novel steps actually. So this is needed in turn to uh, means uh, reduce the load of our what chemical toxicants in the agricultural system. So cellulose degraders, so lots of microorganisms can be used as cellulose degraders. So we have got potential from Bacillus, Pseudomonas, Cyracea species, Trichoderma species, 
trichoderma basically trichoderma feridi trichoderma harginum they are best uh, cellulose decomposing microorganisms then bacillus pumulus bacillus subtilis they can also be considered as a very good potent sources of means cellulose degrading microorganisms and then these microorganisms they may be under some actinomyces besides based on their compatibility axon we can also produce or we have also developed some microbial consortia Microbial consortium is nothing but there are two or three more or types of microorganisms which are basically compatible in their growth and reproduction in the uh, same cultural media or in the same situation. So they can be used as a whole for enhancing the activities of cellulose degradation. Okay. So these cellulolytic microorganisms, they have some identification characters, they can produce some inhibition zones whenever you do some experiments with these cellulose degraders. So recently we are taking some targets to uh, means facilitate our marginal tea growers in our Northeast India zone. So by uh, means uh, adopting some strategies, by adopting some strategies or low cost production of cellulose degrading microorganisms and besides some of these production technology. Okay, so I also the yeah, diagram it means our protocols also in the next slides. So how we have done this? how we can go or how we can move for the production of this sustainable by fertilizers for, for the first time, I mean, the requirements is we, we have to have the cellulose degrading microorganisms, okay? So we need to do some, uh, means laboratory test by using some uh, specific laboratory media, okay? Some culture media is basically needed to uh, isolate and characterize the cellulose degrading microorganisms uh, and uh, means from diverse environmental sources we can get. Okay, we can, we can get them from diverse environmental sources like cow dung, we can get them from decomposed wood. Okay, so these type of things and uh, these cellulose degrading microbes, they are basic media we have used basically. Mendel series media, then cellulose agar media, cellulose congolude media for their uh, specific means uh, their um, uh, uh, means, uh, color indication activities. And one of the most important thing is that whenever we do these beneficial microbial activities, okay? So one of the most important criteria need to be tested is that pathogenicity test. That means whatever or whatever be the beneficial microorganisms we are using in cellulose degrading activities, we should have to do their pathogenicity test. That means they should not be toxic to human beings or any other animals, okay? So for this also we have some media where we can see there some uh, in specific colony characterizations, means our colony colors indications. And by doing this, we can get that, oh, it is pathogenic or it is non-pathogenic. And only the non-pathogenic ones can be screened out from these activities and they can be utilized for cellulose degradation activities, okay? So this is one of the most important laboratory assay, filter paper degradation assay, which is need to be done because uh, you know filter paper, they have also no, what? cellulose. So we can do some laboratory experiments by seeing their degradation activities. So if the, our strains, they can degrade the filtered papers from their original conditions, you see the long one, this is your control. No? And whenever we are using the uh, means uh, microorganisms, so they can what? break down, they can break this long filter papers. That means they have some degradation abilities. Okay. So this is one of the cellulose activity in vitro. So molecular characterization is very much more needed because until and unless we characterize one microorganisms, it cannot be means what? It cannot be means entire work is not done. So molecular characterization, phylogeny construction is very much more needed. Yeah. So we have also, we need to do or we need to carry out these activities for proper characterization, okay? And then one of the most important thing, we are using suppose cellulose degrading microorganisms, we are using potent worm species, or bioconversion or biotransformation activities. Now, that compost, which is means uh, prepared after 45 to 90 days, the compost which is prepared, this compost is an excellent source of lots of other beneficial microorganisms. This point need to be care taken of because this compost, they are also, uh, means uh, they are uh, valuated products. No? So these valuated products, they have uh, more number of phosphate cellulizing microorganisms, nitrogen fixing microorganisms, this. they have also very good populations of M fungi and then other cellulose degraders. If you compare this compost with some other soil conditions, which is not, means uh, your control, no? other soil conditions means your control, where you have not given the cellulose degrading microorganisms and the potent worm species. So you can get the notice or you can get the conclusion that compost have more and more amount of 
beneficial microorganisms. And these beneficial microorganisms, what can they do? They play an important role in promoting plant growth promotion, which you popularly known as plant growth promoting microorganisms. So these plant growth promoting microorganisms, they can play an important role in the production of cedar fruits. They can play an important role in new elastic acid production. They may be again used as antagonists. Okay, so what we have done, so we have characterized the cellulose degrading microorganisms and these cellulose degrading microorganisms from compost, they have been tested for their activities against some uh, T pathogens. And uh, surprisingly, we have got very good results. Up to 86% means uh, pathogen reduction has been noticed by some potent strains. Okay, so this work is in, still in progress. So, we have used this uh, cellulose degrading microorganisms also and some beneficial other microbes also for formation of root formation with the control. So we have got that when we are applying these beneficial microorganisms, their root formation is very good. That means what? We can use these strategies okay, to reduce the load of chemicals. Earlier, what is happening? So chemicals have been some growth promoters. Okay, So some chemical growth promoters have been added so for uh, root induction. But now what we are doing? So we are doing use of chemical means uh, biological process or beneficial microorganisms. So they can introduce root formation. Okay. So successively pot cultures have been done. So these are different clones, TV clones or to apply means, or means actually uh, T, T vegetable or to apply vegetable clones. So we have tested their activities, renounced trials, uh, quality compost, and then acclimatization of the nursery plants has also been noticed. How they can uh, means uh, plays an important role in reducing the some compaction activities in soil. Okay, so you know that uh, lots of compaction activities happens in uh, soil condition, tea soil, because tea soil is normally rough or it is very hard due to long term application of pesticides. So these microorganisms have also the potential to reduce the compaction, soil compaction, and whenever there is a reduction in soil compaction, soil porosity, soil retention means water retention capacity. This getting enhanced actually. So this is one of the most important means beneficial effects of this cellulose degrading microorganisms. So we are also uh, means uh, doing their mass cultures yeah, in large pits, conical flux, and then we are also supplying them for our cultivation systems. So by conversion of organic residues or different kinds of agriculture or agro wastages for a recycling in agricultural sector is very much more important nowadays to reduce the load of chemicals in agricultural sector and to protect the plants from diverse kinds of pests and diseases. And besides that, strengthen the technology of sustainable sustainability in agricultural system. So this approach is basically reducing the load of toxic chemicals. So this is one of the experiments where we have uh, means introduced our cellulose degrading microorganisms, okay? Uh, and then in tea waste, you all know tea waste. So this tea waste, they can also be used as an important source of nutrients if used properly. If used properly means, if we can, uh, means uh, enrich their nutrient status. And with these experiments, uh, the results, you can uh, visualize the color of the compost. No? So where we are not adding this uh, cellulose degrading microorganisms, so their color is dull. No? And then it is very dark in color. That means this composting activity has been happening. So it is actually up to 45 to 90 days we can see this, okay? So, sediums, so these cellulose degrading microorganisms, so they can, why they are effective actually? So, you know that microorganisms are basically uh, responsible for the production of lot number of means enzymes, like hydrolases, lysases, oxidoreductases, then cellulases, these microorganisms, cellulose degrading microorganisms, also they are known for the production of lots number of enzymes. And these enzymes, they play an important role in the degradation of cellulose ultimately. Also, cellulose is a polysaccharide, and then this can be considered as potential decomposition of agricultural wastages. These microorganisms, why they have been used in this uh, means decomposition or biotransformation activities because of their rapid growth and multiplication activities. Besides, it is a non-chemical approach. It is a sustainable approach. They are non-toxic. They can express a large number of multi-enzyme complexes. They can ability or they have the abilities to colonize diverse environmental uses, okay? So we can get, we can get the samples, you can get the uh, CDMs from cow dung, you can get the samples from, or CDMs from your decomposed wood, you can get it from soils, any kind of soils, okay? So they have also very much more, means uh, ability to withstand 
varieties of environmental stress conditions. So these uh, CDMs, uh, they play an important role thus in developing the technologies. Now recent technologies of our agricultural system is INM, IDM. Na? So integrated nutrient management approaches, this uh, means compost, they can be utilized as what? Sustainable biofertilizers. And in case of disease management approaches, they can be used as efficient microorganisms in disease production. Thereby, we can reduce the load of chemicals in agriculture or any kind of other these agricultural systems. So this is your warm species. Okay. So this there are some potent warm species we are working presently. Where we are working with Asinia fetida, perinox, then uh, Hemianthus, Diodia. So this warm species they plays an important role in or fastening the process of disk degradation. Okay. Earlier, what is happening? Only the warm species have been used for the decomposition activity, which you commonly call as vermicomposting. No? So now what is happening? Microbial enlisting composting means we are using the source of microbial, putting microbes to work for biodegradation activities. Okay. So anonymous prospects in using CDMs for agro waste bioconversion. Then microbial fortification is preparing or it is plays an important role in improving the soil health, crop productivity, and eco enterprise. Then additional enrichment. So what is happening? So whenever you are preparing the compost, so you can also enrich it with some humic acids, amino acids for some value additions. So this is the low cost organic manual production technology. Here there are some photographs. Uh, some of them, we have worked at uh, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, Umiya Meghalaya, where we have used a very, uh, uh, means uh, low cost organic manure production technology. So here we are getting the rice straw or some wheat biomasses, or uh, simply we are adding the uh, warm species and then some potent uh, CDM species, okay? After uh, doing all the tests of the in vitro, then pot experimentations and then pit experimentations, species, and we are ultimately able to uh, supply this uh, organic means nutrients for the marginal growers of the country. Okay, so this is a very low cost production technology. And then uh, what is the significance of basically this microbial decomposition? So microbial decomposition, why it is significant or this uh, sustainable source of biofertilizers. Okay, so this is very much more significant in the present time. Uh, and you can see the composting activities by after composting, you can see the composting activities by their visual straining of their temperatures, normally 160 to 80, 180 degrees centigrade, it is uh, essential. And then color, darker in color, odor, okay, then other impurities should not be there. Then moisture content. So moisture content is usually tested by compost. In case of compost, moisture content is usually tested by some squeeze bowl test. So whenever you get some soil, either it is composting soil or either it is composting, whenever we get some manure, it may be composted or it may, it may not be. Na? So microbial enriched, whatever be the compost, so they have some unique characters. So this is actually basically a squeeze ball test. In case of squeeze ball test, what happens? So if the, uh, uh, means you can prepare a ball in your hand. So it is a squeeze ball. And this, uh, whenever you can, you can uh, if the soil forms a sticky ball, okay? So this is clay soil basically. It is not a compost soil, it is a clay soil. And this soil is fertile, but isn't likely taken by the plants, okay? And uh, then if the soil fails to form the ball, whenever you are making the squeeze ball test in your composting activities, uh, the soil fails to form the ball. And then this is sandy soil, okay? So this is, uh, this is actually, again, it keeps falling upward into sand-like particles. It is usually lighter in color, okay? So you can prepare, you can prepare, Squid ball, okay, but but it is a fully compost soil, or your composting activities has been done. So you can prepare a what? So if the soil forms a ball, but looks like a crumbling piece of cake when pressure is applied, okay. So this is the actually very much more fertile soil, and it is an organic matter means a rich soil. So it is a mixture of sand and clay. So another points need to be taken care of that is porosity, moisture content, okay? Then pH is also another important thing, so which is uh, need to be taken care of. Normally what is happening during composting, normally what is happening during composting, uh, uh, the pH normally moves from 5.6 to up to eight. And whenever the product becomes stable, it is normally six to eight, okay? So uh, this pH, 
So this pH is also old. Compost microorganisms actually, whenever composting is done, so temperature is also getting enhanced. But whenever composting activities are uh, means uh, stopped, then what will happen? So you can uh, means uh, mm, prepare the compost in a set dry and 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 you can mix it well. So this will actually properly aerate the but compost activities. So this is very much more essential to maintain or to optimize the pH, to optimize the temperatures, to optimize the acidity and other conditions. Then organic matter contain, it is rich in organic matter. Then if you test it for some other macro and micronutrients, it is also very much more rich in, okay? Then total salt content is also very handsome. Then cation exchange capacities, very much more with good conditions. Then compost stability, microbial activity. So we can test the microbial activity. Yeah. So we can test the different kinds of functional categories of microbes in compost, like phosphate solubilizers, nitrogen fixers, other cellulose decomposers, then other beneficial or antagonistic and actinomyces species. Then we can also test for some impurities, contaminants, and it should be free of some, this type of things, okay? So pathogenicities is also very important. After composting, this compost should, should, uh, should be taken for pathogenicity test. As earlier mentioned that, it should not be pathogenic. Actually, what is happening? Normally in composting, temperature is very high, no? so 160 to 180 degrees centigrade means, uh, and at that moment, and these composting activities normally kill the pathogenic microorganisms. So that's why this microbial and risk composting, it is very much more uh, actually effective. Uh, and it is uh, now, or it is recently been adopted in the last two, three decades. Okay, so it is uh, for a sustainable biofertilizers in agricultural systems. So what are the different advantages? Why we should use this uh, organic means manure or this sustainable biofertilizers? Yes. Uh, can you quickly uh, run through yes. the slides? Within, within, yeah. within, within five minutes, I will conclude. Yeah, okay, our next okay, guest yes. is waiting. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank within five minutes, I will conclude. Yes, thank, thank you, thank you. Yes, so these are some of the advantages, okay? So what means advantages means why we should use this uh, means organic fertilizers or this sustainable process, okay? Instead of those, those chemical fertilizers or to reduce the load of chemical fertilizers. So this uh, means organic fertilizers. So they play an important role in nutrient uptake. So they are basically rich in lots of other nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, okay? Organic, if you test it, then they can play an important role in improving the soil physical properties like water retention capacities in soil, porosity, texture, okay? So they play an important role in increasing the rootlet size and longevity, then protection from lots numbers of soil-borne phytopathogens. So there are lots number of soil-borne pathogens. They are normally in soil. So this type of uh, soil-borne pathogens can be easily killed by this compost, okay? So this water relations and drought stress. So this is one of the most important problem in uh, relation to climate change, no drought tolerance. So now it is happening. So is an important role in reducing the, this type of adverse effects. Then enhance phytohormone activity, enhance phenol activity, and a lot more. So now, then another does this, it has a it tremendous applications or it has a healthy and implementation or significant component of INM, integrated nutrient management. Okay, so they harbor the growth and multiplication of other functional categories. I have already mentioned that compost is very much more rich in lot number of functional categories of microorganisms like phosphate solubilizers, nitrogen fixers, then uh, sulfate reducers. So if you use the compost or if we have the technology or if we uh, have the habit to use this composting uh, means in our soil to, to, to nurture the soil conditions, we automatically can reduce the load of chemical fertilizers because this compost itself have nitrogen fixers, this compost itself have some sulfate reducers, this compost itself has some phosphate solubilizing microorganisms, okay? So it functions in long duration, okay? Then causing improvement in soil fertility and maintains natural habitat. So they can place in their cost production, cost of production is also very, very low. You can uh, produce it in a very cheaper technology that I have mentioned, what is going in different agricultural systems like ICR, like Tuklai. So they are environmentally safe. This technology is very much more environmentally safe, non-toxic, it has no any health hazard problems. So they can play an important role in boosting the protection of the plants against diverse kinds of pests and diseases. So thus, these CDMs can also be properly applied as an important component of IDM. So with special reference to T, as we see the soil compaction, I have mentioned the soil compaction at uh, very significant adverse effects on 
changing the physical, chemical, and microbiological properties of soil. So whenever the soil gets compact, what is happening? So you can, uh, means the plants can properly absorb the nutrients from the soil. So these uh, CDMs, we have done some experiments, I'll show that the adoption of quality by fertilizers and efficient microbial enucleum when they have been added, so they can play an important role in reducing the soil compaction. So that the soil fertility eating means what? Increased and the plants can easily take the, what? Their source of nutrients. So this is some, our means, uh, Peat activities means peat production activities where we can see the growth and vigorosity of the CDM consortium up to 96 hours of our growth of the strain. Okay, so this is uh, some of the degradation experiments. How they can how they can be used for their quick degradation activities. Okay, so in rice uh, means uh, some agro waste uh, products. So these degradation activities we have tested in the large peat assay, and they can be easily used as a mulching materials. Okay, so earlier the mulching materials has been used without the activities of these uh, CDMs. Now the CDM activities has been properly going on, and this uh, can actually uh, retain the moisture uh, means contents, and they can additionally provide some sorts of other nutrients, very major nutrients, then secondary nutrients, and then micronutrients, okay? So this is one of the important experiments where we, saw we got the decomposition activities by using the pruning litters. So this is the uh, your bug density, uh, measuring the bug density, we can uh, test, uh, we, we can have some data of cellulose degraders in affecting the soil compactness, that is uh, soil hardness can be lowered or the soil can be nurtured or soil can be fertility can be increased by addition of this cellulose degrading microorganisms in soil. So thus, uh, they play an important role from above discussions. We, we came to know that besides this biological, these uh, CDMs, uh, they are important role as biological component. Doctor, doctor, can you hear us? Okay, we think we lost Dr. Pranav Bhattacharya. So in that case, we will invite our next guest speaker today, uh, Professor Pramil P. Tiwari. Professor, you are with us. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. And uh, I shall be, yeah, good morning. Good afternoon, actually. Oh, it's yeah. lunch time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, Professor, because of the first two. No, 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 no. It's understandable. The opening batsman normally hit it out. Uh, if I can request you with due regards, uh, you can keep the introduction of Dr. Tiwari to the basic minimal. That will give me an opportunity to talk to my audience. And uh, I think it's a humble request. Uh, please. Uh, decide what you feel best. Yes, yes. Sure. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, students, now we are having with us Professor Pramil Tiwari. He is an alumnus of Banaras Hindu University and now heads the Department of Pharmacy Practice at the Naipur Mohali with 30 years of experience in academia. Uh, yes. And then Professor Tiwari has mentioned, uh, mentored over 150 pharmacy m -Farm students and doctoral students. Uh, here, his research group has more than 200 uh, uh, papers, research papers published. So, with this uh, short introduction, I will invite Professor Tiwari to be. Professor, you can start. 
can you hear me doctor yeah can yes, you hear yes professor okay i think because i am the host now there is someone called deep shikha in the uh, waiting yeah she is a professor from iac bangalore <laughs> actually okay uh, she has to start by 1 o'clock okay i i will, I will talk to her. Uh, no it's just fine i need to know how much time do i have because i don't want to spill over and i know the as organizer i know yes sir do i uh, have 20 minutes of time back to back yes yes professor you can sure you can go. right yeah And that looks good thank you thank you thank you you would let me know if my screen becomes visible because uh, uh let it just go Just one sec. Yes. Okay. I think uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, if you can see my screen, you guys will let me know. Uh, yes, Professor, we can see. It says uh, regulatory aspects of Ayurvedic medicines. Yeah, in my name. I think that looks fine to me at least. Yes, Professor. Yeah. very good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and uh, i appreciate this opportunity of being with you this afternoon to talk uh, something that i know about uh, regulations pertaining to ayurvedic medicines i would like to express thanks to professor anil gupta who has uh, placed me into this and it has been a pleasure in the last couple of weeks talking to you and your team boys and girls ladies and gentlemen i know this workshop uh, is going to be running for something like 3 weeks and i have seen the agenda it's fairly diverse and what i am going to be talking about is something certainly not those things which are written in the books so forgive me i will not bring in there but yes as a <coughs> i was introduced with the uh, well, accumulated years of uh, work and that too in diverse setting i have been largely into academia and i had a chance to work at dabur research foundation as a scientist and that opened a entirely new vista for me that opened out totally new and i am going to touch something very fundamental and uh, forgive me if it sounds rudimentary or superfluous but that's what i had chosen to talk to the audience today and uh, you would let me know if the slides move because this is something in the this age of technology i i am on to my next slide that says why this discussion and uh, doctor can you see that is this transition uh, yes professor you can see oh, that's that's soothing so essentially we can uh, we do consume lot of things but when it comes to medicines no we cannot take chances if i bought a shampoo and the shampoo is not meeting the you know kind of standards that i expect i can probably be go back to the store argue get a replacement or get a, my money back but in case of medicines this certainly does not happen so medicines once it is given you we cannot take chances and i'm sure uh, medical audience or those with a medical uh, learning would understand this certainly there is a misbelief that all the plant products are safe i want to break that myth no it is not at all correct morphine is a compound which is the most potent analgesic and morphine is certainly not a safe compound those who have been using it in their labs i had opportunity to use morphine yes it is kept under lock and key for the only one reason that it has a potential for addiction and uh, tolerance so that is two we are talking about human beings we are talking about chemical substances and when these chemical substances get into the human body obviously they interact with whatever biomolecules they are present depending upon their chemical uh, nature and i think with this background what i am going to be talking about i am going to be talking about what exactly are the principles of ayurveda and uh, how are those medicines evaluated in terms of evaluation 
let me make it clear, ladies and gentlemen, uh, contrary to a belief that one can manufacture anything in the name of Ayurvedic medicine and uh, sell it. No, it's not that. Our country has a mechanism in place which uh, permits complete control in terms of manufacturing quality. And that's what is going to be discussed. This is a line published way back in Lancet. And this uh, gentleman, Cyril Chandler, former dean, I want you to read the last two words of these two lines. And these says, relatively safe. And the second line goes to say, potentially dangerous. I hope you can see my screen. And yes, of today, the medicines that we use, they are certainly dangerous. And the ones, because advancement is expected to bring better medicines, more effective medicines, and this advancement comes at a cost of safety. So I think this has been something very impressive and uh, I have taken the liberty to quote it out here. But essentially, we will look at the basic principles of Ayurveda. And I'm, I seek your pardon. The idea is not to respond to an illness. The idea is to maintain a state of health. And I'm sure, uh, I'm told uh, many of the participants to the workshop are uh, young uh, undergraduate students in various uh, disciplines. I'm sure you, some of you must have noted a grandparent at your home who wakes up at a given time, four o'clock and dot, you can set up your watch with that. No alarm, nothing doing, takes a bath, 12 months of the year, does not require warm water, hot water, you know, all those things, but has a perfect timing of sleep, needs his dinner, uh, his or her dinner at a given time. And I will not be surprised is this person whom I'm talking of is something close to 80 years of age or something even more. So essentially, Ayurveda promotes a balance between mind, the physical body, and the environment. And I'm going to blow it out with this basic principle. One of the basic challenges which I have noted while working with uh, my earlier organization, the people who know Sanskrit today are not aware largely of the modern methods that you know. And vice versa, most of you know, who know the most advanced methods of uh, using a particular uh, instrument, a high-end equipment, probably have studied Sanskrit up to a certain level of school education. And this gap is killing the system of medicine, which we have all, when it comes to Ayurveda, yes, we said last two years, Ladies and gentlemen, they have taught us a lot of uh, disciplined uh, ways of life. They have also taught us the life being precious. And I, don't, will, I will not go beyond that. So with this basic principle of Ayurveda, I want your attention here on the concept of Tridosh. I come from Hindi heartland and... Uh, Professor, forgive me if, if I get into Hindi, but this is only to, because when we write it in English, we would call it Tridosha. It is not Tridosha, it is Tridosh. And when I say Tridosh, it is three, and Dosh is something which is a fault. In Ayurveda, it says Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. For the sake of simplicity, it has been translated many times and it has been, the, you know, the Sanskrit word has been brought as close as possible. So Vata is the energy behind the movement. Pitta is metabolism. And Kapha is the energy that goes into the lubrication and structure. Now, this is not sufficient. So essentially, 
Yes, the energy that goes into movement is vata. Digestion and metabolism, it is reiteration of those. This balance between these three tridosha is something that is essential. And this explains to me why curd suits some people at a given uh, time of the year and it may not suit some people. And this difference, I repeat, this difference between modern system of medicine where a paracetamol 500 milligram is perfectly okay for any adult irrespective of the weight. Today we are talking about personalized medicines. I want your attention to analyze this concept of Tridosh. I don't want you to be Ayurvedic practitioner in case it requires a lot of learning and we will go there. But this concept of Tridosh, this balance is something and I'll take a moment to talk about each one of them. Vata, as it is said, it represents air. Those who are from Hindi heartland, those who know Hindi will certainly. It explains that those with this prakriti, they are generally described as cold. I want your attention on point number two. The people with a vata dosh would normally be creative, energetic, and also very slim. I know this might sound uh, something ridiculous, but then, because I am not a practitioner, I have myself uh, tried to acquire some of the knowledge and I am trying to put it across. So, this is what the second point here is where I want your attention. And when we move to Pitta, sorry, Kapha, people with Kapha Dosha in the last one, they are the ones who rarely get upset. So, these three, three dosh which we talk of, Vata, Pitta and Kapha, this exactly defines a person. I could be a Pitta dominant person or I could be a Kapha dominant person. Someone else could be a Vata dominant person. To understand this, one needs to know how to characterize this Vata, this Pitta and Kapha. There are several tools which are understandable by people like you and me who can read English. It has been translated. But still, I say with confidence that the best way is a still human method. And those practitioners, they know, or they observe the person and they are able to define whether it is Pitta dominant, Kapha dominant, or Vata dominant. Right? Now, <clears throat> Pitta, as I said earlier, one of the components, point number three, if I can have your attention, yes, those guys are athletic, have a very, the build is highly muscular and mostly they are known, they turn out to be strong leaders. Now here is the balance between body, mind and environment. This description I hope shall uh, bring some alignment into what we are going to be discussing. We have all studied 10 plus 2 plus 3 or whatever system of education. I want your attention on the subjects that go into study of Ayurveda. The first subject is Sanskrit. And there are as many as 16 different subjects. I would want you to spend a moment here, there. If you can be with me on the point number five on your uh, left-hand side of the screen, I guess you can see the screen, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. It says Rachna Sharir. It is nothing, it's anatomy. It is anatomy. I want your attention there again on item number 13 and 14 which says Shalya and Shalakya, that is surgery. Item number 15, Stri Roga. Item number 16, which is Prasuti Tantra. So essentially, 
the subjects that are taught to a student who opts for a, to study Ayurveda studies everything that a MBBS student would do, but the only thing is the treatments are different. I have marked Sanskrit in red because I still see Sanskrit as a big barrier in understanding of Ayurveda. One could translate, but that translation has to carry the same bhav. It has to carry the same meaning. So that's why Sanskrit becomes a strong point for those who want to study Ayurveda because most of the text is in Sanskrit and you will be surprised at least I am aware of two gentlemen in the country, at least two that I am aware of. They are over 75 years of age. They have been practicing doctors and they have now started the brushing up their Sanskrit so that they can read the original text in Ayurveda. You might be wondering, why did I get into this discussion? Yes, the, I think the answer is very simple. The belief that uh, herbal medicines do not work, I think uh, last two years, it has uh, certainly shattered the myth. Walk into any household, you would find a giloy uh, liquid being touched, some, uh, some, some plant product being extracted, people are taking steam, people are doing everything to protect them. And this all comes from mother nature. So with this, if I have to define what is an Ayurvedic drug, I would essentially want your attention on the second one, which is in a black color. There are, like any subject that we can imagine, there are certain texts, and I'm very happy for the organizing team, which has given some very meaningful links in the program uh, agenda, and I had uh, taken uh, opportunity to surf through those links. I don't need to reiterate those uh, points which are already mentioned in the links. And I'm sure uh, the participants would have run through this. I'm referring to the classical drugs. And these classical drugs are the ones which are manufactured according to the formulation which is described in the authentic text, that means the source is probably one of the Nikantu or it is one of the authoritative tests. I will not get into that. Yes, ASU, and I'm sure many of you are aware of Ayush, A-Y-U-S-H. If we talk of ASU and the classical books, yes, as many as 50 books in Ayurveda, 30 in Siddha, which stands for S, and even Yunani, 14. Mind it, when modern medicine was not there, people were surviving and surviving healthy with ASU and these systems. Moving to the testing part and the areas of clinical research, I want your attention and I will take a moment to talk about the clinical trials. I'm told some of the participants have a background in pharmacy. For them, it could be repetitive. But still, when someone wants to get into clinical research, what exactly you want to do? Yes, I want to see, I want to validate if a particular principle given in Ayurveda is actually happening or not. And that is the point number one. I also would want your attention on point number three which says standardization and validation of the therapy or the procedure. Kerala, down south in our country, is known for panchakarma therapy. And I'm aware, and I'm sure many of you in the audience and the organizing team, you are aware of the benefits of panchakarma and those who need to get into that. The last one, the fourth one, yes. Establishment of the dose, duration, indication as per the classical textbooks. So these five areas actually define clinical research in Ayurveda. 
And contrary to my belief and uh, belief of uh, many people who do not uh, know Ayurveda as well as actually those practitioners, agencies in the country and even the World Health Organization, they have laid down very clear guidelines for regulating this. And I'm, I don't need to go why regulation is needed. Regulation is needed for manufacture because that defines the quality. Regulation is needed for sale. And third, regulation is also needed for creating a testing facility where these components will be tested. A little of Hindi and I am uh, not sure, but look, let's look at the principles. The letters in orange or, uh, yeah, the letters not in black. It is actually Hindi and it says Apto Pradesh, that is evidence based on leads in therapy. Pratyaksha. Anyone who knows Hindi would also know Pratyaksha is direct. So evidence which is direct is called Pratyaksha. Mm -hmm. Anuman is guess and that is what is translated into a logical inference an educated guess and upamana upaman is a analogy and the last one is yukti which is a reproducible design of an experiment now with these five principles the clinical trials on ayurvedic medicines stand and those five are simple to understand i would in fact, I can jump because I promised students uh, from pharmacy schools, forgive me, I hope you are aware of this, but uh, those who have not been to a pharmacy school, I'm sure you are aware of this. I want your attention on these four phases of clinical trial. And uh, one morning when you walk into this area of work, I guess you need to be aware. So essentially there are fa four phases. There is a phase zero, which I'm not talking about today. And phase one is into a small group of human volunteers. The important point is, it is a first time in human, FIH, that what we call. So in the phase one trial, it is not administered. The test drug, experimental drug is never administered to patient. It is administered to healthy volunteers and information is obtained on the side effects, on the safety of the doses that are predicted and obviously how the drug is metabolized. But in phase two, escalation comes into picture and this escalation goes, the sample size increases and in phase two trial actually, first time, a new medicine gets reaches the actual patients. A concept that uh, I have been talking about and I want uh, your kind attention here. Two words, can a drug work? Does this drug work or does this medicine work? They are two entirely different point. Can a drug work is only possibly a in a chemistry lab or in a drug discovery, okay, it will work because it fits into this and that. Does a drug work? You get the information only after conducting clinical trials. And for conducting clinical trials, the Drugs and Cosmetics Act is very clear. It has lately been amended at least twice in the last 10 years so that clinical trials give us reliable results which can be depended upon because practitioners will derive information from what is available in the trials. And not only that, when it comes to evaluation of the results, obviously expert groups, and I'm sure this uh, uh, three week program has multiple experts. Yes, they want to look into the safety of the drug. They want to look into the efficacy of the drug. And most importantly, they also want to see, is this treatment 
better than what is already existing. So I think in phase three trial, a comparison is something that is important. And I can skip the five elements of clinical trial design. I, this is taken from uh, literature, which is already available in the open domain. When we say randomized clinical trial, yes, gold standard. No one knows. The patient does not know. The uh, prescriber does not know who gets the test drug, who gets the standard care, right? Two treatments, blinded, and the unblinding is done at a much later part. So randomized clinical trials, ladies and gentlemen, continue to be the top of the line or the golden source. Yes. Clinical trial types, I mentioned type phase one, phase two, they are the various stages. But when we talk about tribes, we could have treatment trials, we can have prevention trials, we can have diagnostic trials, screening trials, and the last one is quality of life trial. I'll take a moment to talk about the last one, which is quality of life. You are aware that a person on dialysis, a person with severe uh, renal dysfunction has to undergo dialysis. And it is certainly not something that one would uh, welcome. Or an old man with uh, poor knee function has difficulty in taking stairs. And in those chronic conditions, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the quality of life trials only find out ways how to improve the comfort and improve the quality of life of patients who are having some long-term illness or some chronic illnesses. So clinical trial essentially are these five types. Certain text could define a sixth one, but that is perfectly okay. I now want your attention on these five bodies. I know you, are, you all have access participants to the workshop, you all have access to the internet. CCRS, Central Council for Research in Ayurveda and Siddha. It has a website. I would want you at your ease. CCRUM, Central Council for Research in Unani Medicine. The websites, I had deliberately picked it up here. The third one is Council, Siddha Council. The fourth one is Homeopathy. And lately, the fifth one has been yoga. So when we say A-Y-U-S-H, Ayush, Y stands not for Ayurveda, Y stands for yoga. And I think at the close, I would want you to note down if you have, have a paper and a pen. This is something, a cover page for a guideline series. Yes. This is published by the Ministry of Ayush, which is a government of India structure. And it gives all the guidelines for drug development when it comes to Ayurvedic formulation. Not only that, the, in this series, the third one talks about guidelines for clinical evaluation of Ayurvedic interventions that we talk of. And I leave you here with this these two titles. See, these are available on CCRS website. It's a, it could be a 94 pages PDF. The other one is a smaller one. I would strongly encourage you to run through these pages and at least try to read some of it, maybe jumping the paragraphs. And the clinical research protocol, this is what typically goes for modern medicine mind it and take it from me for sure. The clinical trial protocol, clinical research protocol for an Ayurvedic medication is same as it goes for a modern medicine. So in terms of rigor, in terms of testing, there is absolutely no relaxation which is given to Ayurvedic medicines, they are tested with the same level of rigor with which modern medicines are tested. I think I need to thank you all for your patience. 
this is the entrance of the institution where I work. And uh, I will leave it. Yeah, I spilled it out. Sorry. But uh, I think that is all I needed to. And I'm very much open. My email ID is here. And uh, Dr. Amar, uh, participants can reach me out on the email. And I'm very much here in the office still to take any questions which they may have. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Professor. Over to you. Uh, students, if you have any clar clarifications, you can ask Professor Tiwari. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I would expect you to introduce yourself so that at least I know my audience. Please, go ahead. So my name is Rohan Saxena. I am from SRMS CET Pharmacy Bareilly. Right. So my question is uh, why it is very much difficult to get a US FDA okay. approval for the herbal drugs. Okay. Fine. Uh, you seem to be a student in a pharmacy school. I can uh, figure it out. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Saxena, getting an approval from any regulatory body and you are talking about US FDA, right? Higher, yes, higher, yeah, higher the, what, what do we want? We want highest level of uh, quality. Is that when we talk of medicines? Yes, sir. Right. And when we want highest level of quality in medicines, we need to have highest levels of standards to follow. I'm sure you will agree with that. Yes, I, would, I would only put a little clarification on this, where there is a common uh, myth in the media that India has more than 100 US FDA approved manufacturing plants. Mr. Saxena, these plants, plants means manufacturing facility, these manufacturing facilities are not approved. What is approved is it is approved for cephalaxin, manufacture of cephalaxin injection. I'm sure as a pharmacy student, you know that. Now I'll answer what you asked. So when we want to go for US FDA approval for herbal drugs, right? You know, in paracetamol, you can assay the paracetamol in a chemistry lab and you can say, okay, this sample contains this much of paracetamol. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We do not have still, despite the advances, we are growing. With Anya Somnifera, I'm sure you are aware of. Yes. Now we have markers, vidanolite 1, vidanolite 2. So if I have a Vithania Somnifera sample, Yes, I'll be expected to see how much of what is the content of withanolites. And that is something matching the active pharmaceutical ingredients. Isn't it? Yes, sir. Anything that we eat, and yeah, I think a little later, there possibly you would also break for lunch. Try to find out garlic, onion, jeera, anything that we eat, and I'm not trying to drive any agenda out here. Anything that is available on the food table, each one of them has a specific function. Right? It is, yes, hard, it is hard to quantify and produce evidence, but then there is light at the end of the road, Mr. Saxena. It is hard, but not impossible. I hope I have been able to address your point. Yes, sir. I, I, Thank you, sir. I repeat, it is hard, but not impossible. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I would imagine not. It's lunch, yeah. close to lunch time. So right. the yeah, our audience would be hungry and a hungry audience certainly cannot uh, digest anything just like that. <laughs> anyway. That's uh, you can share me your presentation, Professor, then I will pass it to the students. Maybe they can learn it from you. That should not be a problem. I would do that post-lunch because I'll myself take a 120. I'll myself okay. take a print. You will have it on your mailbox, right? Yes, sir. Thank, yeah. you. Thank, you, Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, I stand with what I said. Those are my personal views and they do not reflect in any manner the views of the organization that I work for. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. You.
Thank you. All the very best in the initiative that you have taken up. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Professor Deepshika. Professor? Yeah, hello. Uh, Hi, good Dr. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, students, uh, we'll continue with our last session for today. Uh, we are having with us now Professor Deepshika Chakravati. Uh, she is a professor at the Department of Microbiology and Cell Biology, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore and currently holds an Astra Chair Professorship. She is an Humboldt Fellow and did her research work at FAU El Grand, Germany. Uh, Professor Deepshika did her Master's in Microbiology from Nagpur University and PhD from National Center for Cell, Pune. Her research focuses on infectious disease and vaccine development. Her work has been published in top biological journals, including Journal for Experimental Medicine, EMBO Journal, uh, Journal of Immunology, Infection and Immunity, Journal of Clinical Microbiology, uh, AAC, Journal of Actinomicrobiology, Microbial Chemotherapy, PLOS Pathogen, etc. She has won many awards to her credit like Tata Innovation Fellowship, Astra Chair Professorship, SK Chatterjee Award, DAE Outstanding Investigator Award, uh, National Bioscience Award, DBT, uh, Nasir Reliance Industry Platinum Jubilee Award, etc. She is a fellow of the National Academy of Science India, Indian National Science Academy and the Indian Academy of Science. She is involved in the editorial board of many journals like Virulence, Innate Immunity and PLOS One. She serves as a reviewer for reputed journals like Lancet, Nature Communications, MMBR, to name a few. Her research has been supported by grants from Department of Science and Technology, DBT India, ICMR, DAE. She has more than 150 papers in international journals and guided more than 20 students uh, towards their PhD and 10 more uh, on the pipeline. So more than 200 uh, summer trainees, 60 academies uh, summer trainees have worked in her lab. Most of the PhD students are faculties in reputed institutes like IASC, BITS, Pilani, NIT, etc. Uh, she is a passionate teacher and a mentor and she aims to teach microbiology to the children and general audience and bring about the importance of microbes in day-to-day -day activities. So with this introduction, I invite Professor. Professor? Thank you. Or is yours? Thank you, Dr. Murugan. Thanks for such an elaborate introduction. I am really humbled. And uh, I'm not sure how are you going to all uh, be here without lunch. So I would request that it is as it is an uh, online mode. Kindly take your lunch and uh, just listen. Just keep your ears open. <laughs> the rest you can just listen. Awesome. Yeah. So kindly have your yeah. lunch because otherwise it is. And uh, I would request all my young colleagues uh, to, uh, you know, ask questions as much as they can because that is really a very good way. So let me first share my screen and I'm going to take you through the journey of what we are, what we do in our lab. Uh, Dr. Murugan, you kindly let me know whether you can see my screen. Uh, yes, doctor, it's visible. And you can also hear my voice, right? Uh, yes, doctor, perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, colleagues, so um, let me take you to the journey of infectious disease, what we uh, do in the lab for decades now. And uh, our lab specializes in understanding the role of uh, certain compartments in infectious disease, especially bacterial infectious disease. So, and how does it correlate or how does it corresponds with the host immune response? So that is how is the title? It's a host immune response in response to infections. Now, if you uh, just let me put my pointer. Yeah. So if you see this title, it's a life in a vacuole. So what do I mean by this life in a vacuole? So I'm going to tell you a story of a particular pathogen that our lab works with, which loves to live within a vacuole. Now, what is that vacuole? That also I will try to tell you. And I, I guess that we have colleagues from many different branches, like maybe a lot from pharmacy, a lot from microbiology, biochemistry, etc. So uh, kindly ask questions in 
from you know with respect to anything that you would like to ask in the end and uh, i will tell you in the very outset that all the questions are very important so don't consider any questions to be just uh, you know very simple questions all questions are important so the research that we are going to discuss or the paths that we are going to discuss in fact bridges between the metabolism the uh, ecology leading to the therapeutics and the pathogenesis so unless you know about the bacteria or the virus or the parasite or anything that you're working with, the therapeutics becomes like shooting in the dark. And no reason that why we are failing so much in developing a therapeutic, the therapeutics to act. The first reason is that we do not know enough of the pathogen or enough of the infectious disease. An infectious disease is a millennium. You believe it that it is it will it has already crossed more than the uh, deaths which are caused by metabolic diseases and others so infectious disease will always remain at the top of uh, causing morbidity and mortality the morbidity is a problem morbidity is the way of life or the way by which you carry your life the ease and the happiness with which you carry your life infectious disease actually curtail that mortality is fine it is the, not the dead end but it is the quality of your life that is extremely important. And that is the reason if you understand the, the behavior of a pathogen, you can also understand the intervention strategies and how you can improve the quality of life. So let us get into the, the bug today, which is none other than the bacteria, which is Salmonella. So Salmonella is a gram negative bacterium. Many of, of you have heard about this bacterium. It is a bacteria which causes gastrointestinal disorders and typhoid fever. So it is a very specific uh, typhoidal serovar and non-typhoidal serovar. So it's peritricus with many flagella all over. And that is why it is extremely active to swim and get inside the body with contaminated food and water. Now, once it gets inside the uh, from the contaminated uh, with the help of contaminated food and water, it passes through your foot pipe, it gets into your stomach, it withstand the severe acidic pH of the stomach, which is around 2.3 to 2.5. And then it ends up in something known as a small intestine. Now, the small intestine is the site for not only this gastrointestinal bacteria like Salmonella, but Salmonella, Shigella, uh, polio virus, many of the virus which takes a route through this gastrointestinal infection, a small intestine is very important part for the pathogen to hold on to it. Uh, so you can now start to analyze that how smart the pathogen can be to withstand all the stress that it is uh, having on its way and then land up in a small intestine. Now in the small intestine, uh, many of you are very well aware of the physiology of the intestine or the tissue architecture of the intestine. But just for the, uh, for the benefit of all of you, I have drawn a schematic and I will explain it to you what it is. Now, the small intestine cells, so these are the columnar epithelial cells, a small, say, a schematic portion of the small intestine. What you see on the, uh, what, 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 what is there on the top of the small intestine, you call this as the enterocytes, are the mucus. Now, it's around 100 to 120 micrometer mucus lining. Okay, let me just put it to a pen so that you understand it much better. The pen option. Fine. So now this one is actually lined by 100 to 120 micrometer thick mucus. Now, this mucus is secreted by cells like uh, of the intestine. And this mucus is the most important protective barrier that you may have. Now, on top of this mucus, you have this so-called gut flora. Now it is a very hot uh, topic, you know, every journal you open or every talk that you listen, there will be at least one on the so-called gut microbiome. And there is so much of hue and cry about probiotics and why you, we should preserve our gut microbiome. The very reason that you need to be understanding a lot about your gut microbiome is because this is an another organ in your body. Now, this another organ in your body, which is these 230,000 species of bacteria, fungi, certain bacteriophages, which shape up of your gut microbiome, is the protective barrier. If you somehow abuse your mucus, 
by taking some harsh food or alcohol so that this becomes thinner and thinner and your gut microbiota is perturbed, this bacteria finds a very easy way. Now you also will understand that how difficult it is for these bacteria. Now see, the bacteria has, is coming to the small intestine and it has to fight up, fight with this mucus lining and on top of that, these many species of uh, your gut microbiome lying. How this bacteria makes its way? This is a very intelligent strategy. How do they make its way? Because this mucus is very viscous and bacteria does not secrete mucinases so that it can just, you know, dive through, dwell through. Here, in the entire enterocyte lining, you have a very specialized cells. Now, these specialized cells are known as an M cell. Now, the, this M stands for the membranous cells. Under the electron microscopy, you see them as a membranous cells or the microfold cell. They're also known as microfold cells. They throw up their arm like this and they catch the bacteria. So this actually, this arm goes above this mucus. You know, it stands above this mucus so that the bacteria which is coming simply can slip on to this microfold cells and then it can be transcytosed from the apical site. So this is known as the apical site of the uh, small intestine. And then this is known as a basal site. Basal site is the internal site. So it can very easily slip from the uh, apical site with the help of these microfold hands that it is showing up. And this process is known as a transcytosis. So from the apical site to the basal site. Now the basal site of this small intestine uh, is known as a lamina propria, you know, LP. Now this lamina propria, small intestinal lamina propria, you have a resident stromal cells. These are fibroblast cells. And then you have large number of these very important cells like neutrophils, T cells, B cells, dendritic cells, macrophages. Now all of these cells, why are they there? They are there so that anything pathogen, if it comes, it can sample it and it should be able to destroy them. And that is where the immunity comes into picture. The immune response in the gut is so highly developed that if you really understand the immune system, it is just not to understand the T cells and the B cells and the antibody and the antigen and the cytokines. It is all about the tissue architecture and in this case, it is known as a gut associated lymphoid tissue, which plays a very big role in the protection. But then we should also understand that though the bacteria, they are some only micron in length, they are too much smarter to evade the system. What is the reason that actually bacteria became a pathogen? We never understood this. Why are we in an arms race? And why are we so hostile to each other? What is the reason that we have to constantly battle for getting new antibiotics, new intervention therapy with increasing number of infectious diseases? What is the reason? What have we done? We have done something very wrong in the past that the arms race is continuing. And I do not see as a medical microbiologist or as an infectious disease uh, uh, personnel, I do not see that there is any dead end to this. Now in lamina propria, where all these bacteria should have been killed, what happens? The macrophages takes it up, the dendritic cells takes it up, you know, these dendritic cells takes it up, and these cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, instead of killing the bacteria, they take it to the other organs, like mesenteric lymph nodes, spleen, uh, liver, etc. And there it starts proliferating, and that is how the disease sets in. And if we do not get an appropriate antibiotic, it leads to a very high mortality. Now, it's just not a typhoid fever anymore. At the end of this talk, I will tell you something a bit more about what is this typhoid, uh, how this typhoid fever has actually taken a toll. And what is the reason that this typhoid fever, though uh, uh, you can say that it can, it is just taking, uh, having a high, uh, you know, uh, uh, just let me put my timer. Yeah. So it's having only high fever. It is just not the case. Somebody who had typhoid during the childhood will see that there is some kind of a trace which remains. And how it gets manifested, I will uh, let you know, uh, you know, in the end of the talk, with some very interesting data came out with our collaboration with Neem Hans, that how it has still left a mark and how the person actually has some kind of a derangement in their thinking, mood swings, low hemoglobin, not able to concentrate. But the bug has cleared off. It is 
off from the system. Let us understand what is the reason. Now the bacteria is being seen by the cells. So the first cell I told you that it is a, uh, the M cells or the enterocyte the epithelial cells, and it is taken up by the cells. Now by default, this is the cell naive plasma membrane, okay? Now any bacteria, if they are intracellular. Now, a little bit of uh, uh, knowledge is required about the kind of the bacteria that uh, one gets infected with. One is intracellular, that means it would like to get inside the cell. Other can be extracellular, that means it will simply stay here. It doesn't want to get inside the cell. It will do all its processes by secreting the protein, but by itself, it would not go. A good example of an extracellular bacteria is a Vibrio cholerae which causes cholera. It simply does not invade. But in this example, this is an intracellular bacteria. That means it would like to get inside. By default, it has this so-called membrane around it. This is a plasma membrane, okay? So this one, we call it as a bacteria containing vacuole. So the green is a bacteria. Now this is the vacuole. So bacteria containing vacuole. Now this bacteria containing vacuole uh, is foreign to the body, right? In this case, say, for example, I take an example of a non-pathogenic bacteria. Say, um, many of you have worked with E. coli in the lab. Say E. coli BH5 alpha, one of the uh, very uh, meek, very mild strain we used for genetic engineering. Suppose if I have ingested E. coli DH5 alpha, it will be taken up. And this particular bacteria will undergo a modification, which we call it as a bacteria containing uh, vacuole will undergo a modification. And during this modification, there will be many proteins from the early endosome, from the recycling endosome, from the late endosome, gets attracted towards this uh, bacteria containing vacuole. Now, finally, what it will do is the cell's host immune system, innate immune system, the defense system will kick start, and this bacteria will get co-localized with the very toxic vesicle, which is known as a lysosome. You know that the lysosome is an organelle which contains very degradative enzymes like cathepsins, hydrolases. And if this bacteria gets interacted with the lysosome, then it will totally get killed. So this will meet with and dead end. And that is how many of the non-pathogenic bacteria, they get cleared by the system because the lysosomes play a very important role. Now, what happens if we put a pathogen into picture? Let us go by one by one, the pathogen, so that you have a very clear understanding of what I'm talking. Take the example of a Shigella and Listeria. Now, Shigella is a gram-negative bacteria. Listeria is a gram-positive bacteria, okay? Now, both of them are a top 10 bacteria uh, for food pathogens. The beauty of this bacteria is they are pathogen, but Unlike this bacteria, which will come as a default in a vacuole, they also come in a vacuole, but they quit the vacuole because they possess a toxin. They quit the vacuole with the help of the toxin and they come and they multiply in the cytosol. Cytosol, uh, cell cytosol is a good environment. They simply multiply and their life is also not so simple, uh, but they cannot spread the infection very fast. So they get cleared by the host immune system. You will never hear a death or a morbidity by Shigella, which causes dysentery, or by Listeria, which causes food poisoning. Uh, there is a bit of diarrhea, dysentery, maybe a one day of hospitalization, and everything is okay. Now, you take uh, an example of uh, Staphylococcus aureus or Mycobacterium. Now, Staphylococcus aureus is a gram positive bacteria. Mycobacteria, you classify it as an acid fast. You, you normally do not tell whether it is positive or negative. Um, I, I will not get into the details of this, why it is not, but you just take a word for it. This You call it as an acid fast. Now, what they do is they definitely come in this kind of a vacuole. And instead of getting all the way being targeted by the lysosome because the pH will go down, what they do is they arrest the phagosome. They will arrest it. What do you mean by arresting? That means they will not allow this vacuole to proceed to get localized with the lysosome. They will somewhere arrest in between so that the pH remains in the range of seven and they will very beautifully multiply there. That's it. They, they are happy and they cause their pathogenesis. Now we call about, talk about salmonella. 
Now, salmonella is a pathogen which will not only stay in the vacuole, it will not arrest its phagosome. The pH of this vacuole is acidic. Normally in acidic pH, none of these bacteria will survive, but the pH is acidic and they multiply within the vacuole. So this is the beauty of the salmonella. And no doubt that why this pathogen is becoming so notorious in causing extra intestinal infection. So it is just not the typhoid fever. It can cause endocarditis, osteomyelitis, meningitis, and a host number of other diseases. During COVID time, there was a huge cases of co-infection of COVID with salmonella. And the mortality was very high in those patients who had a salmonella COVID co-infection together. So it is completely perturbing the immune system. It is that intelligent that it can stay within the vacuole with an acidic pH of roughly around 5.2 and they multiply. The question is how? And this is where we need to know if we want to successfully have an intervention strategy. So what is it that Salmonella is doing? Now, uh, because we are a hardcore experimental biologist, I will also like you to introduce to the system so that many of you who are more interested can delve into it, can make your own uh, you know, hypothesis, test your own, own hypothesis. And it's not that difficult to ask the questions in these directions. Let us look into the cell and this is our model system. So we use animal models, of course, we use many cell lines because this will give you a first-hand information about how the bacteria behaves. So this is a raw macrophage cell line, a raw 264.7 cell line. This cell line is a mouse origin uh, cell line. And this is a very, it comes as a very handy tool for us to uh, you know, study many of the bacterial lifestyle within a macrophage population. As you know that the macrophage are one of the most important cell in the innate immune system. So it is uh, an excellent uh, strategy to use this cell type. The green one, what you see here is a, a salmonella. Now our lab uh, expert, uh, expertises in making uh, various constructs of salmonella. So we have red salmonella, we have green salmonella. This is a GFP expressing salmonella. We have a cherry red expressing salmonella, et cetera. And then we have a variety of mutants. Uh, in the salmonella genome. So the entire biology is just, you know, popping up as a, a beautiful uh, discovery. So if you really look into these life inside, a cell, raw macrophages, has been infected. How do you do this experiment? You plate your macrophages and put the bacteria. There are certain incubation temperature and then the bacteria gets internalized. Macrophages are highly phagocytic cells. So they will take up the bacteria. And once they get inside, you see that the bacteria are residing in this vacuole, what we call it as a vacuole. Now the vacuole is nothing but by default, the plasma membrane plus many of the other proteins that get recruited. It is still a mystery. How many different proteins of the host or the bacteria makes this vacuole? For, uh, for, a safe, uh, for, for, for the sake of easiness, in this case, we use RAP7. RAP7 is one of these GTPAs, which is a marker for many of these late endosomes, early endosomes. And uh, this RAP7 is used as a convenient marker for SCV. So is a LAMP1. We'll come to LAMP1 later. So what you see is this bacteria is beautifully residing in this vacuum. Hmm, I hope that you can see that. So uh, this is a confocal imaging microscopy. So you just remove this bacteria from here. You see uh, by, of course, optically you see that they're enclosed. It's a very tight fitting vacuole, yeah? Now, this bacteria is in a vacuole. You have a single bacterium, so this is rod shape. You have a single bacterium in a single vacuole here. This is extremely interesting. This bacteria is getting in, is a single bacterium. And throughout the study, it remains as a single bacterium. What does it mean? One bacterium is becoming two, two bacterium is becoming, uh, two bacteria are becoming four, that means there is a logarithmic progression happening. Many of you have done your growth curve, isn't it? So when you do your growth curve in your LB, what is it, the X and the Y axis? You start from the lag phase, then you go to the log phase, and then you go to the stationary phase and a bit of the death phase. This is a very classical experiment that you do during your graduation. You know, If you have taken MSc microbiology, yes, even for pharmacy, this growth curve is one of the starting point. Now, this kind of growth, which happens in the liquid medium also happens in the cell. Otherwise there will be no disease process. So they grow. 
But when they grow, they are still seen in a single vacuole. This, they don't come as a multiple bacteria in a vacuole. And that is what became a very important finding of our lab where my first colleague uh, who was MBBS doctor who joined my lab when I started, when I joined as assistant professor way back in 2004. And my first colleague, my first student, PhD student, he was a medical doctor. And you know, the doctors uh, or the, the, the uh, individuals with the professional course, they have a, a lot of patients. They can, especially the doctors, they can see things, they are not in a hurry and they simply go through it. So when he was doing his scanning electron microscopy and confocal, he realized that indeed every time the bacteria divides, but they always end up in a single bacterium in a vacuole. What is the reason? I can so look at this. Uh, take a very closer look. Now this is the macrophages. This is the transmission electron microscopy. A very difficult experiment where you infect it, then you cut the sections of the of the cells. You know, and then what you see here is the bacteria which is dividing. So this black is the bacteria and now this is the uh, vacuole which is dividing. So the bacteria is dividing, but finally when you end up, you, you end up with one bacterium per vacuole. What does it mean? The bacteria divides definitely, the vacuole also undergoes a constriction and a fission along with the bacteria. What is, how can that happen? Bacteria we can understand. You have the bacterial division machinery, but how the vacuole, which is made up of the cell uh, protein, the host cell protein, how this can undergo constriction. This was a very interesting part. And all these strategies are so important to evade the immune system of the host. Only when we are knowing more and more about it, we are getting more and more baffled by the beauty of this particular pathogen. When you take a very closer look again in other cell lines, so always a question with the cell line is this, you can use raw macrophages, you can use J774 and you will still, something will come to your mind that is it a cell line dependent phenomena or it should happen. If this is the real situation, this should happen anywhere. You can close your eyes, you can take any cell, you throw the bacteria and then when you look, you should see a single bacterium in a vacuole. And that is really the true case that we have found. This is the intestine 407 cells. And you see here that a single bacterium in a vacuole. They end up with a single bacterium in a vacuole. So you need to do hundreds and hundreds of these kind of sections to see that, yes, at any different, uh, many different time points, you see the single bacterium in a vacuole. Not only in the cell line, also in the animal model. So in this case, we are lucky to have a mouse as animal model. It gives rise to the typhoid fever when you infect them with Salmonella typhimurium and uh, very closely related physiological and pathological parameters to human. So in that way, we are very lucky. It spreads to the liver. And when you take the liver sections, you again see that these are a single bacterium per vacuum. That means it is not limited to the macrophages or to the epithelial cells. It, it is indeed their home, even in an organ. And that is something which has opened up our eyes. The question is, why do the bacteria live, love their studio apartment? You know, the studio apartments for some reason, but as a student, we all lived in a studio apartment. Many of you are living in a hostel. It's like a beautiful studio apartment. You have a one room, you have your study table, you have your kitchen, you have your restroom. And everything is very compact. You don't have to spread yourself much or put much effort, uh, you know, in maintaining them. So bacteria somehow lives in the studio apartment. The question is, what benefits does it get? And only when you know that they have this kind of vacuole and studio apartment, would you design your intervention strategies? Simply dumping antibiotic into this will not work because antibiotic will not reach your studio apartment. You need to do something which is, so if you put a lot of antibiotic, it is being, it will not reach. You need to do something that will penetrate. And that is where a lot of nanotechnology came. We will discuss a bit about it. First of all, what are, what are their uh, plus points? Why do they love their apartment? Firstly, it's a reduced competition for the nutrient. You can imagine, you know, many of you are interested in cancers. You know that there's a phenomena where the tumor is growing in the core cells, they die because of hypoxia. 
all the cells at the periphery, they are okay. Similarly with the bacteria, see what happens if the bacterium is growing in large number and all of them are in one vacuole and, and this scenario when they are in a separate vacuole, yeah, you have a two situation here, sorry. Pardon me for my bad drawing because this is, I'm drawing from the mouse. Now, if you look into this uh, part, uh, there are many bacteria in a vacuum, so the, only the bacteria at the periphery again will get the benefit of the nutrient and all the bacteria at the core will die, so it's not a good strategy. But if it is all in the separate vacuole, each and every bacterium, as a growing number of the bacterium is happening within the cells, each of them are separated by a compartment, so each one of them will get their own share. Also, there is an increased surface area for nutrient acquisition. And the, how do they survive? Now, th there is a very different procedure altogether for the bacteria to stay in this acidic pH of, uh, not this is not 5.2, but in this case, this is, uh, sorry, not 2.5, but 5.2, the acidic pH of this vacuole. What they do is this bacteria, today I don't have time, but sometime if I have, I will open, up, open you up to the entire world of bacterial injection system or the needle system they secrete something known as this bacterial injection or the, uh, the secretion apparatus. And by, with the help of this, they secrete the protein into the host. And this allows these, uh, the bacteria to survive because they hijack everything that is required for the cell towards itself and they survive very well. So this is what is meant by each bacterium can secrete the effectors into the host cell milieu thereby uh, the, the advantage to the bacteria is maximized. And one more thing, if you have so many number of growing salmonella containing vacuole, host also must strategize so many number of lysosomes to kill the individual bacteria. Suppose it, if it is all the bacteria in a one uh, vacuole, one molecule, one uh, lysosome will come, uh, will get fused and delivered and all are killed. What happens to this? You need three, 10, 15 different lysosomes to actually kill them. So the host has to now increase its toxic granules to kill the growing number of bacteria. So all these strategies are best fit for them, for the salmonella to become such a successful pathogen. The question is, how do they divide? And why? first of all, they definitely under constriction, but how do they divide? So when we were really thinking very hard and breaking our head to understand, Bacterial division is okay, but why the vacuole and how the vacuole? We took a, a, a great lesson from mitochondria. Now, you know that the mitochondria is one of the, maybe the last great example that we have of an endosymbiont. Mitochondria is none other than an alpha proteobacteria, which harbored our cell millions of years ago stayed very calmly within the cell, no hostility, and became one of the major organelle. We call it in a layman's language, a powerhouse of the cell. Hope that all the infectious disease in years to come become something nice like mitochondria, but I don't have any hope. The reason that I, do, I say that I do not have any hope is because our hostility approach already began. Our hunt for antibiotics, hunt for antimicrobials, dumping the system, already began. So I don't see any back. It's, it's not a fault of the bacteria, but it is kind of a fault of ours. Anyway, so mitochondria divides. It's an alpha proteobacteria. The origin is alpha proteobacteria. It's an endosymbiont, and it is one of the important organelle. It's also having a double membrane. So it's an outer membrane, and this is an inner membrane. And the mitochondria divides. You know, they undergo a fission process by this kind of a molecule, which is a, uh, the DRP1. We asked a question, the similar kind of approach, is it also true for the uh, bacteria, uh, which is in the vacuole? So the bacteria divides, but this machinery can get recruited. Is, is it true? So uh, we uh, indeed wanted to know whether that is the case. So we marked some of these compartments with this KDEL sequence, and we uh, did some live imaging. So these all, uh, you know, experiments need your real live imaging system to see how the bacteria and the vacuole is getting divided. Otherwise in fixed sections, it will not be that clear. It actually shows, you just put your attention here, that the bacteria is green, you see the constriction. Now the constriction side is being marked by this KDEL 
sequence, which is, you know, it's kind of a rope. So it's tying and then it is getting separated. So we are trying to do uh, many, many more experiments to first understand that how this site is marked and how the bacterial constriction and the vacuole constriction happens. ER endoplasmic reticulum plays a very important role. And that is how we are getting into the much more details. So these are a lot of electron microscopic images to uh, show the same. So the dynein and the uh, salmonella, it has a very good relationship. So the dynein mediated vesicular transport, it was known to control the salmonella replication. And uh, uh, so if it is ending up in this single vesicle, uh, single bacteria per vesicle, what experiment you can plan? You can plan what I can do to make this bacteria come as a multiple bacteria in a vesicle, right? That is the first question that will come to your mind. How do you do this? So in this case, if you look at this particular figure, now this is the, the cell uh, macrophages and you have this beautiful bacteria. All of them are in single bacterium per vacuum. In this case, a particular experiment, we stained it with LAMP1. LAMP is nothing but lysosomal associated membrane glycoprotein. It is also one of the very good marker for SCV or the salmonella containing vacuole. Um, so you have to perturb it in a way that they all come in one bacterium per vacuole. One can use this chemical sodium orthovanidate, though it is a general protease inhibitor, but at this particular concentration, it will make the, uh, it will inhibit your dynein and it will make the bacteria come all in one, this vacuole. You see here, this is a single bacterium per vacuole and this one is a multiple bacterium in a big vacuole. So it's like a balloon a balloon getting filled up with many bacteria. Now, lay down your hypothesis. If that is true, what is the fate of these bacteria? They're all coming in a, uh, one vacuole. Are they going to be successful in surviving? What do you think? Are they going to be successful in surviving like them? Let us see how they will be. Now, we call this as a vacuole containing many salmonella. We see MS. So when you treat the bacteria, the cells with the orthovanidate, and you see the percentage of the VCMS in the vanidate treated cells, you see many events with multiple bacterium in a given vacuole, right? Now, in the control cells, that means in this particular cells, these are the control untreated, you just see a single bacterium in a vacuole. But what is the fate of their intracellular life? It is just the opposite more the number of multiple bacterium in a vacuole, less is their ability to survive. That means their survival capacity goes drastically down and they are dead. That means if you can perturb not the bacterial replication, but the division of the vacuole only, you can meet or you can take care of the salmonella infection. Is it indeed so easy that it seems to so in fact, we used many different techniques. We overexpressed one more protein, which is known as a dynamitin. Now, what does dynamitin do? Dynamitin simply works opposite to the DRP1. That means it will negate out the function of the DRP1. Uh, dynamitin expression will see uh, same as that of the vanadate treatment. So the moment you overexpress dynamitin, you see that all the bacteria that comes in a vacuole. Look here, many bacteria in a vacuole when you express dynamitin. These are all uh, expression studies. That means that you take a construct, you put it in the cells and you transfect your mammalian cells. And then you do this experiment after infection. A big difficult experiment, but absolutely not that it is not doable. And you see that the same thing, when you overexpress dynamitin, the life of the salmonella comes to the dead end, they die. Uh, and DRP1, which is the protein which is responsible for the division, it does get co-localized with the salmonella containing vacuole. So all these information, it suggests that indeed the DRP1 is extremely important. Went more ahead to look into all these mutants, you know, don't get worried about this. So once you prove something, you need to prove much more than that. You don't stop here. So you use a dominant negative DRP1, you use the catalytic mutant. And every time you do that, you see the similar phenotype that the, in a nutshell, more the number of the bacteria in a vacuole, that means in one vacuole, if there are 10 bacteria versus one bacterium in a vacuole, the bacteria dies. That is the end. 
Now, we know from the host site that it was a, a dynene or the DRP1 related protein. What is it from the salmonella? Uh, as I mentioned to you that our lab is very good in making the mutants and we have a library of mutants. We realized that one of these mutant, it is uh, named as a RFAG, this particular salmonella mutant, that means the salmonella not having this gene, when you infect the uh, macrophages, you see that this mutant ends up also in a multiple bacterium per vacuum, and this mutant cannot grow in the salmonella. Again, proving that this studio apartment life is the best life for their growth. If you put up the studio apartment life, they cannot grow. Yeah, that is the nutshell. So we use the word divide and rule. In this case, it is a division and they end up in the single. If the divide and rule strategy is somehow hampered, they are not going to grow. So this is the very interesting and very, I would say one of the most smart strategy of the bacteria that, uh, you know, I have ever come across in this case. Uh, and now let us understand. Uh, so I will, uh, uh, um, this is the same thing which I mentioned to you that and the more experiments with the RFAG shows that this bacterial mutant somehow was not able to maintain the single bacterium in a given vacuole, but they ended up in a multiple bacterium in a vacuole and they proved to be totally non-virulent. That means when you infect the cells, you don't get any viable cells at the end of 16 hours of infection. Then the role of this endoplasmic reticulum in the uh, vacuolar division, as I mentioned to you, is very important. So currently we are doing some really very in-depth experiment. And as I mentioned to you, these are very, um, how to say, minute experiments, very in-depth experiments where you have to be very careful of the events that you are trying to see, both with the help of the live imaging microscopy and with the help of uh, electron microscopy. So uh, these experiments currently we are doing a lot to understand uh, more about what is the role of the ER in marking the site and then undergoing a vacuolar division. So let me now take you through the another part of uh, host immune response and how this uh, bacteria actually secrete certain proteins or the host secretes a protein and the bacteria is using like a double-edged sword. That means this protein that I'm going to talk to you about is highly lethal for bacteria, but how bacteria is making use of it. So it's evading completely the host immune response. So the immune response against invading pathogen can be controlled by many mechanisms. It can be by the generation of, which is oxygen dependent by reactive oxygen species, uh, it can be oxygen independent with the help of the various enzymes like elastases, cathepsins, proteases, uh, bactericidal permeability increasing protein. Now, this is the protein that I'm going to talk to you about, which is known as a BPI, bactericidal permeability increasing protein. An amazing antimicrobial peptide, by the way. But let us see that how interesting for the bacteria to simply negate it out. So, uh, neutrophil, say for that matter, has all the ways by which it can take care, oxygen dependent, oxygen independent, a specific uh, lactoferrin molecule, lipokaline, uh, so many antimicrobial peptides, so many lethal enzymes, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, this BPI is the one which we are going to discuss today. This is nothing but uh, known as a bactericidal permeability increasing protein. And this is a 55 to 60 kilodalton protein. It is antimicrobial in nature. Okay, now uh, the groups have been successful in expressing this protein, many of them. And actually, this is so beautiful protein that if you take it in isolation and give it to the bacteria, the bacteria dies. Not only that the bacteria dies, but it can quench the lipopolysaccharide, thereby protecting the animal from endotoxic shock. The sepsis, which is caused by the lipopolysaccharide, this BPI has the ability to quench it. So it has been, it has shown antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, anti-angiogenic, lot of potentials by, for the BPI. And very interestingly, this molecule has been monopolized by a company, which is no, which is a US company, you know, it's an Illy Lilly and company. Now, Illy Lilly, they monopolize this molecule producing this NH2 terminal, small peptide. And you will not believe the cost at which it is sold. 
to take care of the septic shock or the sepsis. Five lakhs, uh, the dose for the treatment is five lakhs per dose to treat a septic shock. The individuals or the human who undergoes a septic shock and, is, and, and they end up in ICU, they are given this dose so that they, their reversal happens. But it is just next to impossible to think about its use by a common people. And it is known to be expressed by the neutrophils and the epithelial cells, this BPI. Uh, and one can commercially use it. So how do they work? So if you really unravel the mechanism of the BPI, you will be very surprised. See, one of the very interesting part is this BPI is only expressed by human. You know, mouse, they don't express BPI. So BPI is not present in the mouse system. It's only present in the human system. So you can see this uh, by the, uh, the PCR analysis that the uh, U937 cells is the human cells and raw is a mouse cell, that the uh, BPI transcript is only seen in the human cells, not in the mouse cells. And uh, if from the human PBMC, you can see the cDNA, 1.5 KB. Uh, so you know that it is exclusively present in the human. Now, it is a mystery that why is it not present in the mouse? So the gene is there but there is some kind of a repression. We are not able to understand that why BPI is not there in the mouse system. And when you stain it, so the, we have an antibody to the BPI and you see that, yes, indeed true, the BPI can stain very beautifully the cells. One of the other marker for the macrophages is CD11B and you see that the uh, cells are very beautifully stained. So uh, the BPI is expressed in the mouse macrophage, in the human macrophages. When the BPI expression, if you now take the BPI uh, and uh, try to understand what is the expression in the mouse, uh, sorry, human monocyte and the macrophages, what you need to do is you take the human macrophage cell line and you give them different kind of a bacterial molecule. Yeah, this is not a pure bacteria. This, these are known as a pattern molecule. Uh, you can call it as a bacterial associated molecular pattern or pathogen associated molecular pattern. I think in this, uh, my colleagues may know it more as a PAMP, P-A-M-P. That is a pathogen associated molecular patterns, which can, um, you know, dock onto the, your toll-like receptors or the nod like receptors. So for example, LPS is a PAMP and it can dock onto the TLR4 receptors. Flagellin is also, flagellin is nothing but a protein subunit of flagella. So this can uh, be recognized by the TLR5, et cetera, et cetera. So the moment you give them these kind of bacterial molecule, you see that the expression of the BPI goes quite uh, kind of uh, high, but though not significant by statistical analysis, but to some level, it can be uh, going a bit higher than the uh, normal uh, cells. Uh, and you see here that with antibody staining also, the Western blot is showing this very beautifully. You will see this, the uh, LPS flagellin, it is showing a very beautiful staining of the BPI. Now, in this particular condition, what is uh, notable here is that when you give them heat-killed salmonella, that means you take the salmonella and kill it, the heat-killed salmonella, the induction of the BPI is kind of very high. But when you give them a salmonella, which does not have the flagellin, that is a delta fly C, the fold induction decreases. That means it is something dependent not on the live bacteria to give rise to this particular peptide antimicrobial protein, but it is the flagellin. Most probably it is the flagella, which does the, uh, does the job. Uh, so the staining also shows the same thing. So this is nothing but a, uh, the facts analysis to show that what is the percentage of the cells which gives rise to this BPI. So the differentiated macrophages, that is with the, uh, when you differentiate it with the PMA, they induce the BPI expression when you stimulate them with a various PAMP. PAMP is a pathogen associated molecular pattern. Now you will ask very important question. It is fine that the macrophages are making the BPI. The BPI should do what in turn? It should kill the bacteria, right? What happens when we infect these macrophages with the bacteria? Let us see what happens. Now you take these human macrophages, it is U937 macrophages, and either you uh, take these macrophages and don't do anything to that, or you want to knock off the BPI. 
you use this BPI double stranded RNA to kind of knock off the BPI production, you know, because you want to show the role of BPI. So the moment you knock off the BPI, you see that the Salmonella typhimurium um, can proliferate very nicely. That means, what does this mean? That indeed the BPI, if it is produced in good amount, can take care of the bacteria. The innate immune system of our body can produce BPI under certain conditions, in good conditions, and can take care of the bacteria. You can see that there is a decrease. And if you don't have a BPI, the bacterial number increases. So many of the mutations in the people or in a population where you see that they actually suffer from the infection so much, you never know what is it. We say that the immune response is downregulated, our my immunity is not good, but what is it that immunity that we are talking about? It may be possible that the ability to make the BPI is somehow lowered and we do not know how. And it is this shows, this proves that the moment you do not have BPI, you experimentally show that indeed your double stranded RNA uh, uh, experiment worked and you do not catch the BPI at a protein level. And when you do not have BPI, your salmonella numbers increases. That means BPI must take care of the bacteria which is coming into picture. And when it comes to the uh, gram positive bacteria, in the gram positive bacteria, this is not acting because BPI functions against gram negative bacteria. It quenches LPS. It makes pores onto the bacterial membrane. So this is a good control that it does not work against a gram positive bacteria, but it works very well against a gram negative bacteria. Even when you uh, see here, so this is a Salmonella typhimurium infection, the moment you overexpress BPI. In this case, what we did, we uh, made a knock down system. That means you have taken out. In this case, experiment what you are doing, proof of concept, you are overexpressing it. So we overexpress it with a human BPI. And the moment we do that, overexpressing a mouse cell with a human BPI, you see that the bacterial number is down. That means BPI, a uh, human BPI has all the ability to kill. Now, question is, can you use it as an intervention strategy to take care of many of these pathogenic bacteria? Answer is yes, but it is just that formulations and etc. need to be thought about. Now, BPI, it inhibits the bacterial replication in a human macrophages. That means our host immune system, if triggered appropriately, is good enough to take care of exogenous infections or the bacterial infections. The question is why it is not happening? Why do we always need an intervention strategy of an antibiotic to get rid of infectious diseases? But at the same time, as I mentioned to you that the BPI is important to kill the bacteria, but BPI also does one more very bizarre function, which you will think that why is it doing? It allows the bacteria to get inside. Now, this is this assay, you can do it by percentage phagocytosis assay. That means my cell, the cell in culture has taken up how many bacteria? How many bacteria, suppose if you give thousand bacteria out of thousand, how many of them are taken in? That is known as a phagocytosis assay. So you see here very clearly, the moment you knock down the BPI, the percentage phagocytosis has gone down. That means the BPI has a dual function. It is killing the bacteria, but it is doing something to even undergo, make the cell to undergo enhanced phagocytosis. Now, this was a very novel finding for us. The same thing it is doing in the human PBMC uh, from the blood, primary culture. This is a cell line, and this is the, from hum what you do is you just take a human blood, you purify the PBMC population, and you do this experiment. And what is the reason that it is undergoing more phagocytosis? I think that what we are seeing here is this, this red is the BPI, okay? It is present on the, uh, on the cell surface. Now this bacteria, the moment you put the bacteria onto the cell, this bacteria interacts with the BPI and the BPI allows it to undergo internalization, more internalization. Why it does, it is still a mystery. But it does, because the moment you downregulate it, you see that the infection is, uh, the percentage phagocytosis is somehow not very good. And the same thing does not work for Staphylococcus aureus. 
saying that indeed the BPI, the role of the BPI is more to do with a gram negative infection and not with a gram positive infection. So it mediates the bacterial entry into the human macrophages. Um, so uh, you, you, you do this experiment at the many different stages and you see that what is the fold proliferation of the uh, bacteria and you see indeed the moment the bacteria is knocked down the fold proliferation decreases the entry actually decreases uh, a, a lot and then the fold proliferation in fact increases when you do not have bpi the black bar is the cell without bpi always the fold proliferation increases because there is no threat and the bacteria grows well so the, the, this particular bacteria, Salmonella typhimurium, it shows less interaction with the BPI during their replicative phase. And this one is very important to understand that how bacteria evade the immune system. So what is the interaction of this BPI with the gram-negative bacteria? If you see here that this is the uh, post uh, four-hour post-infection in this case, you give the, uh, the uh, STM, this green is the STM. Now blue, what you're seeing is a DAPI, okay? Now this one, you uh, stain, uh, a DAPI is a nice dye. You can just throw it in the cell and it will st uh, stain your nucleus, the cell nucleus. It can also stain the bacterial genetic material, by the way. And then this is the BPI uh, staining. And when you see that this bacteria, exactly this bacteria, it is merging, it is actually co-localizing with the BPI at a very early time point. Now, this is a PFA fixed. PFA fixed is a very important control. This is a killed bacteria. For every experiment you do with bacteria, you need to use a killed organism to show that it is a property of a live bacteria, okay? Now, when you use the killed bacteria, you see that the, this also co-localizes. Now, E. coli, which is, we call it as a non-pathogenic strain of E. coli in our case, this also co-localizes. That means the BPI is recruited. This is at four hour post-infection. But when you, and these are all the quantifications which are done. Now this is Shigella. I mentioned to you the bacteria which does not like its vacuole and it comes out into the cytosol, they beautifully get tagged with this BPI molecule. Yeah, because it is flowing very well into the cytosol. So in Shigella, in the case of Shigella, when you do not have BPI, also they grow very well, showing that BPI is a best molecule that you can use it as a therapy. It maintains and very uh, bacteria can maintain a very ac uh, re uh, actively replicating niche. And those bacteria, they do not have any interaction with the BPI. They have to somehow get rid of the BPI. All the experiments that is mentioned here, which I will not go into the detail in a nutshell, tells us that the bacteria is very clever enough to take the help of a BPI to get inside. But once it is inside, it gets rid of the BPI into its vacuole with the help of a other degradation process. And it removes the BPI from the vacuole as and when the time progresses, and it establishes itself into a very beautiful niche. And you can show it by many different experiments using a heat killed bacteria, using a mutant which cannot retain in the vacuole, etc etc so in a nutshell the bpi is expressed in the macrophages and it acts as a phagocytic receptor which will modulate the entry so look at this this is a host protein bacteria is utilizing this host protein to gain an entry it is uh, evading the immune system to gain an entry but once it gains an entry it totally degrades the same bpi with which it has gone inside and happily stays there. So that is the reason why bacteria is simply wonderful. Now, I will also spend a bit of time because many of you here are pharmacists and you will in pharmacology and you are going to appreciate the fact that how the nanovesicles uh, uh, play such an important role uh, uh, to deliver uh, anything of interest. And also I will like to introduce you to a wonderful uh, bacteria, which is a halobacteria. It's actually like an archaea which makes a gas vesicles, you know, and these gas vesicles are like, like nanoparticle. Uh, you can coat the protein of your interest. You can engineer the protein of your interest into these vesicles and they are made in large amount and you harvest them. That means you get these gas vesicles in large quantities and they will be like your delivery vesicle. And we use this delivery vesicle 
and did a beautiful data. Now this week, uh, we got a Melinda, Bill and Melinda Gate Foundation with my collaborator, Sheila Ditya and University of Maryland. And he's, uh, uh, you know, he is an expert in this halobacterial culture. Why is it so important? Why is it so novel than other nanoparticles? Because this is non-immunogenic. It is made from the halobacterium. It's very easy to purify and it's extremely stable, okay? Uh, we'll not get at all into the details of this. If anyone is interested, kindly uh, you can please make a call and we can discuss further. We use this bacteria, this uh, nanoparticles from the halobacterium or the nano vesicles, I would say, from the halobacterium to treat septic shock because septic shock is still the uh, matter of uh, highest morbidity and mortality. And uh, there is absolutely no, I told you, five lakh per a dose uh, that is just next to impossible. Now you look here, the model is simple. You give them uh, LPS with galactosamine and that makes the mice undergo a process of septic shock mediated pathology and they die within eight hours. If you look into this, uh, the nanovesicles delivered uh, BPI, that means the BPI which is expressed on the nanovesicles, all of the mice, they survive beautifully, 100% survival. Anything else does not. So if you just simply give your BPI uh, injected, they don't. And the other mice, untreated mice, they die within eight hours. So it's a dead end model showing that this is one of the, uh, it can be a game changing molecule if it can be taken up on a very large scale to uh, give it to the patients who are suffering from the septic shock. So the gas vesicles, nanoparticle expressing the BPI protein can protect the mice from the endotoxic shock. And it is indeed, not only it protects the mice from the endotoxic shock, that is the death, it also protects them from all the major hepatic injury or the inflammatory cytokines. Everything, all these parameters that we are trying to say here, everything gets protected with the uh, help of this uh, nanoparticle derived uh, BPI. So these are all the histopathology of the endotoxic shock, et cetera, et cetera. Just to make you, uh, make you, uh, you know, impress upon the fact that the uh, nanoparticle, the gas uh, vesicle nanoparticle, uh, which produces the BPI molecule are one of the very beautiful system to get rid of uh, septic shock and uh, severe hepatic injury. Uh, so this was, uh, this is patented now and we are uh, hoping that uh, one day uh, we can get into the trials very soon. So this is indeed a multifaceted protein, yeah? And this multifaceted protein plays a very big role in uh, actually this is a protein which should help us. It should take care of our uh, infection, but it does not do so because bacteria seems to be far more clever by utilizing this BPI and then getting inside and then degrading them. What is required for us to be done is to figure out how do you increase the level of the BPI under certain conditions to the threshold that now the bacteria will succumb to, uh, you know, be killed by the dose of BPI. So that is what the innate immune response and how do you enhance the BPI level? That is what is required to be done. So what I will do is uh, I had put a timer because I do not want to uh, bore you at all. And I, uh, I will sometime when time permits, I will talk to you about that Salmonella did not even... Uh, you know, spare the plants. It is just not the animals, but uh, salmonella infect plants a lot. And if you want to, so I'm not going to talk to you at all about this, but if you want to know about the uh, bacteria and its intervention strategies a lot, one must first know about the niche. We know that now the salmonella is in a vacuole. That means it has a cover around it. The division is very important. And if you stop the division of the vacuole, the bacteria will die. But otherwise, even for you to deliver the antibiotic, you know that these antibiotics is not going to cross these vacuolar membrane. And that is the reason we are failing. We are failing because we are giving just plain antibiotic, which is not going to do anything to the bacteria which is staying in the vacuole. And that is why the chronic infections persist. The multi-drug resistance and the extreme drug resistance are on rise because the bacteria are dumped with antibiotic with absolutely no effect. And then, as you know, that every bacteria, Salmonella is just an example that I've taken. All the bacteria have strategies and one of the very important strategies, antigen presentation. All of them, they inhibit to some extent the antigen presentation. 
And that is how they survive so much. So all these smart evasion strategies by salmonella, by evading the peptide stress, reactive oxygen stress, maintaining this one vacuole per salmonella makes them some of the extremely important pathogen. Intelligent pathogen gives us a food for thought for each one of us to actually put ourselves in their shoes and understand. Now, this is how it comes that you do science, how, why, and where. You draw inspiration from these small bugs and then try to understand that where is this hostility factor coming and how our such a robust immune system has turned upside down. And now we are succumbing to the, uh, you know, to the dead. So if one is very eager, vibrant in asking questions, you will definitely learn in depth about each and every pathogen that you can get. Uh, all my colleagues are very bright colleagues who are in the, and I would request all of you to please come to ISC, join our group. Uh, you can come through any one of these programs, uh, CSI. For the PhDs, it is mostly the GATE and the CSIR, the DBT, the INSPIRE Fellowship. For those who are interested in doing integrated PhD, it is through the JAM. And uh, yeah, so I, I have been very, uh, always very lucky to get this beautiful group of mine. And uh, all of these in yellow, they are faculties elsewhere. They are continuing uh, group. So uh, very vibrant group. And uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And now I'm open to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, students, if you have any questions or clarifications, you can ask Professor. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello. Hello, Arushi. I can see your name. Yeah. Uh, Tell me, Arushi. Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, I would like to say that your information, like whatever the presentation was, it was so informative and I learned a lot about this field. And it has, it has really sparked an interest. Uh, yeah. So, ma'am, my question was that like, you talked about mutants, uh, the act like performing the experiments on the mutants also, especially yeah. BPI. Yeah. So, ma'am, how do you know where to start? Like, what mutants you need to take? Okay. Uh, you are asking me from the side of host or from the pathogen or both? Both. Shall both. I tell you about? Okay. Let me tell you one very simple way to strategize it. Now, suppose you're working with the bacteria A, yeah. You will have your wild type bacteria, make sure that your source is very authentic and you have your cell source, which is also very authentic. When you do the time course infection experiment, you will see, and how do you do this time course infection experiments? You will put the bacteria, you will uh, see whether, first of all, it is intracellular or extracellular. You give them a chance to get phagocytosed and then you see from two hour, six hour, 10 hour, 16 hour, when you plate your CFU, you see an increase. That means your bacteria likes the host and it is increasing. That means the life is established, right? Now, when you see that the life is established, the question comes to your mind. What happens in the host that it is supporting the bacteria? Because your host, which is a macrophage, should be killing it. It has a lot of lysozymes. It has a lot of uh, reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species. Why is it not killing the bacteria? That is the first question that comes to your mind, right? Then you start formulating. Is my bacteria down-regulating the reactive oxygen species? Is it down-regulating the antimicrobial peptide? Or is it down-regulating the nitrogen species? These are the questions you will start asking by doing a gene expression. See the, the catalase genes and the, uh, the reactive, uh, which leads to, you know, the antioxidant, a balance between the antioxidant and the other genes. And then uh, BPI genes for that matter, defensin genes, which leads to the alpha defensins, beta defensins that you will do. And you can have two different data. You see that, no, they are absolutely not downregulated. They are in fact upregulated. That is good that your bacteria is triggering a response which the cell is responding to and you have high amount of these. But the question is, in spite of the high amount of this toxic molecule, bacteria is growing. What is the reason? Then you shift your focus to the bacteria. What is it that is there in the bacteria? And then you start dissecting. For that, what you need to do is you need to look into the bacterial genome and ask a question, whether it is an antioxidant machinery or it is a nitrosative machinery stress response in the bacterial gene, which is going high. 
and you start dissecting from the bacterial gene. You figure out on a gene and then you created a deletion mutant in the bacterial gene, which is quite simple these days. You use a one-step deletion strategy, that's Senko's method, and you delete it out and you repeat the experiments again. I hope I a little bit answered your question. Yes, ma'am, I understood. Yeah, and see, this is step-by-step. Step. So don't get biased. Don't have a pre-biased hypothesis. You are putting up your hypothesis as with a very naive mind because you do not know the bug. You are learning with your organism. So when we put ourselves in the shoes of an organism, you will be very beautifully with a lot of happiness explore the journey. You got it? Yeah. And, and it will reveal in front of you. All these will get, all this will reveal it because you are with very open mind. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Arushi. Yeah, colleagues, questions, please. As Any I other questions? Do not hesitate to ask questions. Anything you can ask. Every question is important. If you don't want to ask, you can also write in the chat box. Is there any question in the chat box? I don't think so. Dr. Murugan, uh, no. Hi, ah, hello, Tarumai, please. Uh, Ma'am, you have hmm. said about that uh, Salmonella uh, is very able to survive in the acidic pH. How yes. is about that? So what happens is Salmonella has some wonderful set of two component system. Yeah, the two component systems are the signaling mechanism, signaling system in the bacteria, which senses the surrounding environment. And then it passes on its, uh, the response to the response regulator. They upregulate the genes for it to give it survival advantage in many acidic stress, uh, osmotic stress, alkaline pH stress, salt stress, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in case of Salmonella, you have some wonderful two component system, 4P4Q system and other systems, which takes care of their life in the acidic stress or in the acidic pH. If you actually mutate those genes, they are not able to survive under in acidic conditions. Does this answer your question, Tarumai? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And what happens in the SCV now, interestingly, in the salmonella containing vacuole, where the pH is also uh, 5.2, that pH is important for the salmonella to start synthesizing its salmonella secretion system, which is encoded by pathogenicity island 2. This is known as a type 3 secretion system, type 3 SS. You know, there are many secretion systems, right? So the type three secretion system, which is encoding the salmonella pathogenicity island two. So that acidic pH is important for the salmonella to kickstart the type three secretion system and makes a needle. And that is how the needle starts producing the, uh, I mean, delivering the protein into the host cytosol. And that is how it is beautifully surviving in the salmonella containing vacuole, though the pH is acidic. Yes, good questions. No questions, ma'am. Yes. Um, ma'am, you also yeah. said about uh, the extracellular bacteria and intracellular bacteria. Correct. So the salmonella, as it is intracellular, so the BPI works with it and we understood. Yeah. Uh, and what about the extracellular one? Is this BPI also works with them or not? No, they don't. See, the extracellular bacteria, uh, say, for example, Vibrio, Harvey, uh, Vibrio uh, cholera. Now, the only very good example of extracellular bacteria, which has still not lost its, you know, phase is Vibrio cholera, because it attaches to your intestinal uh, enterocytes, and it stays there. It delivers the cholera toxin, and the massive diarrhea happens, and all are washed out. BPI does not play a role there at all. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, this is a strict example of extracellular bacteria. Before even Helicobacter pylori was an example, but no longer. Uh, I mean, the groups and many of us have found that it actually has an invasive lifestyle. That means it can invade into the 
gastric epithelial cells. So this looks like that there is uh, some different lifestyle it has. So does that have more, uh, I mean, more uh, dangerous effect or the intracellular one? Okay, good question. You know, you cannot say all the bacteria uses the strategy to maximize their stay. Now, what will you call? Will you call a Vibrio cholerae a successful pathogen or Salmonella and uh, or Mycobacterium a successful pathogen? Obviously, you will call Salmonella or Mycobacteria as a successful pathogen because they stay with the host. Vibrio, it attaches, it causes massive diarrhea. With the diarrhea, Vibrio is also lost. Yeah, this is a typical extracellular. Now, if you uh, talk about intracellular, let us take Shigella. Shigella is intracellular, but not intravacular because it quits the vacuum. It comes out. The moment it comes out into the cytosol, though you have a rich source of food material lying around, but they are not successful because Shigella needs to move from one cell to other. And for that, it needs a very energy expensive process as it accumulates the host acting tail from the host. And it's a very energy expensive process. Once it takes the acting tail, the Shigella moves from one end to other. And it is so energy rich process that it simply gets uh, you know, tired and they are cleared off by the host immune system. So both the ways, yes. Taruma, this is fine. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Great. Your... You have any other questions? You can write to me. My email is dipadipatiisc.ac.in. Kindly uh, reach out to me anytime. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Thank oh, you, ma'am. So I had yes. one last doubt. Yes. Yes. Please. Please. Yeah. So, ma'am, you talked about uh, VDI, and you said that we administer it when uh, septic shocks are yes. there. Yes. So, ma'am, since macrophages are capable of producing it, what are the yeah. factors which make it incapable of doing it? You know what happens during the septic shock? Now, septic shock is a very sad situation. It happens because of our own fault. See, what happens when the person is admitted in the ICU, they are given a plethora of antibiotics. You start from meropenem to cholestine to all intravenous, okay? Now that kills the bacteria. At the same time, it releases. When the bacteria is killed, does not mean anything. The bacteria is killed, but the LPS, which is there, is very active. And when the bacteria is killed, it sheds enormous amount of LPS into the surrounding. That enormous amount of LPS is so fast, so fast, that the poor macrophages, first of all, they're tackling with the, the bacteria which was there. Then a gush of LPS is coming. The TLR4 gets, uh, you know, recognized and then the inflammation start. It is actually an inflammatory response, which leads to the death of an individual. So it is so fast that there is no chance for the BPI to be made, to be produced, to be neutralizing your LPS. There is no chance at all. They are all compromised state. That is why we call it as an immune compromised state. Where your inflammatory arm is so high, so septic shock or sepsis, majority of the people who are dying in ICUs by any infection is due to multiple organ failure. You must have heard this term, right? Multi-organ failure. This yes, multiple organ failure is nothing but is due to sepsis. And the sepsis can be by gram negative and gram positive both, by the way. But uh, the gram negative sepsis is really detrimental. And it affects the liver so badly that once the liver is deranged, it feeds into the kidney, then to the heart, then to the lung, then circle continues. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Arushi. Any more questions? Can you drop your email ID? Yes, of course, dropping. Yeah, my mobile too. Great, all set. Yes. Yeah. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Murugan to, for giving me this wonderful opportunity and the, the audience. My young colleagues, uh, be always uh, vibrant, uh, keep your passion on and uh, learn in depth. Uh, the revelations will come to you. Uh, 
uh, only have that 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 passionate interest in you and be very open be very open the literature is flooded so you sometime gets blocked i can understand oh this is also there that is also there what will i do so you start fresh and you will see that something new is coming to your way okay so thanks so much to all thank of you thank you so much professor thank you thank you thank take care all of you bye bye Uh, okay. Thank you, students. Uh, that's all for the day. Uh, tomorrow we uh, have another focusing on agriculture biotechnology. Okay, we will share with you later everything, all the details. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.